Hello and welcome to the WDW News Today podcast. I'm Eric Morton. With me is Tom Corliss. Tom, we've made it three episodes. We're in episode three. I, I think we made it. I don't know. We recorded all three in in one sitting, essentially, one week. Um, so who knows if by the time we get to three, the show's already canceled and this will never air. You know? Would you cancel it while you're in Paris? Um, if enough people, if we lose enough subscribers, perhaps. Well, that's up to you, but please like and subscribe so we can keep this show going so yeah. Tom doesn't get mean while he's in Paris and cancel us. Get mean? I was born. I was born. Born mean. mean and boy, if internet. you didn't watch episode two, uh, you can go back last week's episode and, whoo boy, yeah. Tom got spicy. Anyway, uh, we are doing long-form discussion on uh, topics that are important to people in the Disney community, I think. And this week, uh, this one's kind of important. Kind of? Yeah, we're discussing... It's, as far as I'm concerned, in the Disney fandom, it's always been the thing that's most important to the fandom, and it's one park in particular. Okay, one park in particular. Uh, what would that park be? That's Epcot. Right. It's the one we all like to complain about and how it was better whenever we were younger. Now there's a whole generation of people who think 2000's Epcot was great. <laughs> there's there's like people that that are like I miss Test Track and Mission Space and you know I remember when Three Caballeros had a screen at the end instead of animatronics. <laughs> those oh, those people are, are grown up now. You remember for like two days you could take a when they redid it you could take a margarita on the boat and then like yeah. nope. Never and mind. someone threw a margarita. Never. I'm making things up. Someone thought it was a great idea. Someone either dropped it into the water or threw it at something, I'm sure. At any rate, we will be discussing the reimagining of Epcot, everyone's favorite and least yeah. favorite Disney park. Feels that way. Is that fair? I think it's a lot of people's favorite, and I don't necessarily understand why people fall in love with the version now, because the version now is not the one I fell in love with, so I don't really... Get it? But I, the thing is, I think, you know, the West Coast people, right? If you bring Disneyland people over here for the first time, they inevitably fall in love with Epcot, I think, because it's just so different from either of the parks there. I yeah. mean, it's got some similarities with DCA, but um, I think it's just so, I think for everyone, I think if you are a Disney fan from one of the places, if your home resort or your home park is one of the other ones in the world. I think you come and Epcot is the only one that is its own thing, right? There are multiple studio parks. There, well, I guess Animal Kingdom, but there's there's animal parks. There's out nothing there, like right? it, right? Epcot. There's no one tried to make a permanent World's Fair. That never happened. Right. Um, and so that exists here, and it's also like it's connected to Walt Disney. It was his last dream. Was this thing he promised the world on television that this was going to be a thing. And it was the last, you know, it, it, it has the most incredible story, I think, of any of the parks in that. It was supposed to be a city. And then basically everyone who worked for Walt Disney loved the man so much that they all swore they were going to stay on until that project was done and gave it everything they had. And it was kind of the last hurrah of the people that worked for Walt until, you know, certainly some people of the next generation of Imagineering worked on it, but... Um, this was really for like the last time that group would work together in a lot of ways. And I think you could say that the Epcot that you fell in love with is different than the Epcot that people fall in love with now, obviously. Yeah. The Epcot I fell in love with is slightly different. And the the one Jason Diffendahl fell in love with in 80, you know, 82 or 83 yeah. is different than that one. There's a common through line that kind of stops now, right? I would say it is more different now than it ever was before. I don't think Epcot, the Epcot of you or me or Jason is... I think those are all fundamentally the same. Just because Spaceship Earth got lightly updated, you know, or, or they took the music out of living or listen with the land. I don't think that was what changed Epcot. Like Epcot had to change over time because it's it, it's like Tomorrowland, right? Where it's like, well, some of these things are going to become dated. Some of these processes, some of this subject material is going to, to date itself, right? Yeah, but... At the same time, there was a there was sort of a common mission of Epcot early on that has yeah. changed. Right now, we have um, we've gone into Future World, and we have basically a a World Showcase Pavilion of a fictional country. Yeah. Right. We have uh, the Guardians of the Galaxy yeah. uh, Cosmic Rewind, which doesn't really have any connection to any yeah. of the genesis of Epcot. Yeah. At least before, for better or worse, 
there was sort of a theme yeah. there. And it was very for Epcot was very forward thinking. Yes, there were dinosaurs, right? Yeah. There were, but those dinosaurs were meant for context as you look forward of to energy sources, yeah, it was, uh, world of what's motion. What's the history of energy and then what's the future of energy, right? And that was right. the through line of, you know, Eric, that wasn't new for Epcot, right? If you look back at the most famous World's Fair attractions, not even the ones Disney built alone, there was always this story of where has mankind been and where is mankind going, right? Epcot ripped, let's be honest, Epcot ripped a lot of stuff off from World's Fairs because that's what it was based on. And so all the Epcot rides did that, right? Spaceship Earth was the dawn of mankind through today into tomorrow, right? Horizons was, what is the, Horizons, even a ride that was supposed to look to what the, what is the future going to be, began with, what did people think the future was going to be Here's Jules Verne. back in the yeah. day, right? It still began with that historical, historical into what we think today will be the future, right? Yeah, and I think then you have Animal Kingdom, which spe speaks a lot to ecology, and yeah. and Epcot was more science. Uh, that's getting blurred a little bit now, yeah. I think, uh, especially with the the new Moana attraction yeah. we'll talk about later. Well, parks parks had individual identities, right? Hollywood Studios was about the magic of movies and television and music and, and actual production, right? And Epcot was about our real world and an optimistic look at the future of it and what's coming next. And then you're right, Animal Kingdom was, you know, a focus on ecology and conservation. And now it's arguable as to, you know, how how little of all three of those themes, Hollywood Studios is completely dead, no longer exists. It right. is it is no longer present, right? Um, and now Epcot, it's very close to non-existent. It's still there a little bit because I think someone, people had a conscience about Epcot, right? Again, because of that Walt Disney through line. I think some people in creative places were like, oh, maybe I feel bad. Maybe, it's, yeah, we have to put Moana in the park, but maybe it has to be educational, maybe. <laughs> You know? Yeah, I mean, you could say World Showcase has changed very little over the years, right? I mean, they've added some things, oh, and, I don't agree and they've that. changed out some shows and things like that. But in terms of, of the feel and, and experience of going to World Showcase, it's very similar to the way it was, a, except for the addition of festivals, which you know has really no, changed that part. When I was a kid, no one wanted to do any of the rides in World Showcase. Now they're like IP based. There things was that only people one know. ride. Well, I mean, the attractions, right? Yeah. Like. Let, let, you know, I know people love impressions de France now. Yeah. No one, no one went to see that then. No one was going in the Canada film. No one was going in the China film. The American Adventure was not highly attended by people. Um, neither was El Rio del Tempo. It's the reason they overlaid it. Um, and Maelstrom for that. Maelstrom was, was a different thing. Maelstrom was a guest satisfaction thing, I think. It's funny because like, it came along later and it yeah. was kind of um, – I know when they opened it on a TV special, it was kind of portrayed almost like a thrill ride. Yeah, I think there was a problem. Is people then went down one tiny drop and were like, that was that was it. I also have no idea what happened on this ride. But also that was it. That did bring yeah. it to two rides, though, right? And then yeah. there's two rides in World Showcase now. We but have, then, we have like, three. the decision was made to where at some point it was like, okay, well, we need to bring characters into World Showcase. And it's a slow progression, right? It begins in the 90s. You see character meet and greets with characters specifically from – certain countries, that's the beginning. Then yeah. you start to see it on merchandise. You see pavilion merchandise with specific characters on it. You're like, oh, okay. And then finally, you know, Epcot's big moment, I think, is is 2006. I think 2006 is the moment where Seas with Nemo and Friends opens, and it's, it's an Epcot Future World pavilion, and it has characters in it. And then very short order after that, Grand Fiesta Tour, right? It's the yeah. first World Showcase attraction. Um, with characters in it. And that's that's the moment where things turn and it's like, you know, well, maybe the park is still about edutainment, but edutainment with familiar characters who sell merchandise. And then eventually it's that becomes... not the becomes, worst idea. No, and I don't hate that idea either. Like using the characters to educate, not a problem. The problem is later when it becomes, the characters can just be there because... Because this is the country their story is from. We could build a frozen ride because it's loosely from near Norway. You know, and yeah. that's I mean, that was inevitable with the with the success of Frozen. Yeah. It was just the it was kind of built in, right? Yeah. There there's also always trouble getting um uh, sponsorship and people yeah. on board to pay for the attractions yeah. and things like that. And I know Norway is one of them yeah. that has over the years kind yeah. of uh, ebbed and flowed a little bit. Yeah, none of them are sponsored anymore, but right. but at least there were third party companies ingrained in some of them that, that you know, uh, took on the burden, right? So France has always been all the dining in France is third party. Um, in Japan, all of the dining and merchandise, the, that whole pavilion is third party, essentially, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, 
but yeah, Norway was one of those where it was, you know, for, for a very long time, it was, it was unsponsored pretty much from the moment it opened, everyone sort of bailed. Um, but then you get to this point where they're like, okay, well, France, well, Ratatouille, here we go. <laughs> like, what does this teach yeah. you about France? Teaches you about food. No, it doesn't. You learn nothing about food in that ride. They didn't even take the time to translate half the dialogue back from French from when yeah. they built it in Paris. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. Yeah, well, I know, like, for years and years and years, they've had, uh, like, Marie and some of these other characters yeah. to meet and, and greet in France. Uh, Snow White's been in Germany forever. That was a 90, in the 90s right. that all started, yeah. Right. The character started. bus was the beginning. Oh, you yeah. know about the character bus? Uh, I remember bus? the character bus. Sure. That was my childhood was the character bus. That was really, like, because Epcot opened, there were no, everyone knows this, but there were no characters. Disney characters were not allowed in Epcot. That's why they were like, oh, we have this purple dragon. Like for kids, they were like, okay, we have singing fruits and vegetables and we have this purple dragon and the dream finder. That'll be the stuff that's like super kid friendly. Smart one, a talking beaver yeah. when you build a roller coaster. Yeah, yeah. There, there was kid friendly stuff, but it was all its own content, right? The Disney characters are not here to um, distract. But then by the, Eis by the time Eisner comes in and it's the mid eighties and it's like, okay, we need something needs to happen at this park, and they're like, "Okay, Michael Jackson 3D film that that's going to help." And then the other side of that is Mickey and Minnie and and the gang in spacesuits. It's like we need to make this happen. And scuba and then, suits, yeah. And that <laughs> evolves into the character bus, which was the big character involvement. For for those of you that don't know what that was, um, they had essentially World Showcase when it opened had to transportation two transportation systems. They had the friendship boats, and they had the they were omnibuses. Yep. There were Magic Kingdom omnibuses that operated and drove you around World Showcase. Those didn't last forever. One of the buses very quickly just became, uh, the characters came out to music, the bus parked, they did a little show, and then you could go meet the characters, and they got back on the bus and they went home. And that's what it was. And it was that was one of my most vivid memories of childhood is, you know, waiting for that bus to come out and then running to meet characters as they got off the bus. Yeah. I think there is a difference, though, between having the characters present in the park yeah. and then having the characters as the anchor attraction to be the of the land, right? So yeah. uh, Remy now with Ratatouille, uh, as you said, Frozen, uh, Donald, and uh, you know the other two Caballeros. Yeah. Uh, it's happened over the years. I don't think the evolution is bad. I think for the evolution for the sake of inserting IP is maybe yeah. the problem that a lot of people have with that. Future World, though, it's a mess. Yeah. Right. That's the one where I – see, I've always believed if, if you're going to evolve the park, right, World Showcase appealed to adults. How do you make it appeal to kids? And that was always the challenge, right? That's why Kid Cot was invented. That's why they put characters back there. And so the challenge was how do you how do you get kids excited to go to the back of the park? And I don't necessarily have a problem with – like Grand Fiesta Tour, I think that's where those characters are from. They're from that region. Sure, why not? Um, you know, and Frozen – Well, I hold on. It. It's an attraction about Mexico. Yeah. Featuring Donald Duck, who's not from Mexico. No. Um, Jose Carioca is from, from Brazil, Brazil, right? It's yeah. kind of like lumping everyone in and being well, like, they're, they're all, they don't even speak the same they're language. They're traveling musicians. Yeah. Is Panchito from? Panchito, I He's think, from is Mexico. from Mexico. Yeah. Uh, but but Jose um, is no, but Brazilian, his, doesn't speak he Spanish. He his, his uh, compadres with him. He can't perform alone. <laughs> I don't have a problem with the three caballeros. I will yeah, get. Yeah, like let one that of them's slide. from Mexico. It's not like that big a stretch, and yeah. it's still like it's still the travelogue, right? It's still yeah. like these are things you can do in Mexico. The Mexico's known for, right? It just so happens that the caballeros are flying through them. So I'm okay with it, right? Yeah, I think they're trying to do they're me. trying to do something nice and 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 cute with characters to get kids interested, kids interested in in. It. in the air, right, and then that's the gateway for kids, right? And then it's like, okay, well, we actually, we booked a reservation. We're going to eat at this restaurant in Mexico after, and it looks out at the Donald Duck boat ride. And I think for kids, that I get it, right? I get it. Future World, I feel very differently. Future World, I feel like it's There's supposed to be a serious look and an optimistic look at what tomorrow will be. And I don't know that movie characters and cartoon characters do that correctly. There's this kind of overarching theme, I think, with Epcot, which is they try to do these things that they think people are going to like. They try to appeal to Epcot people who – we had an episode on Disney adults, the much maligned Disney adults. And within that group, the much maligned group is the Epcot people probably, the hardcore Epcotians. Epcot. Yeah. But I think 
what's happened is a lot of this tries to appeal to Epcot people without understanding why people liked Epcot. Yeah. Why why that appealed to people. So a good example I think is Epcot Forever. I don't when you describe Epcot Forever to me, I'm like, yeah, all those songs I grew up liking, yeah. all this kind of stuff. But it's kind of like they told somebody about Epcot and what it was, and they just kind of read up on it and like, okay, this song was there. We'll reimagine it. It's like they told Chat GPT, write me a show oh, with agree. these songs. I don't think it has any soul. And then curiously throws in a whole new world at the end of a But we we know the story behind that. I've told you the yeah, story. We tell the tell the people. Yeah. So Epcot Forever was supposed to solely be a, a show with historical music from Epcot. Right, that that was the whole thing, and so most of it is the show that was envisioned until you get to the end, when Disney came to the composers and said, "Hey, the new park's going to be different, and it's going to be full of Disney stuff. Could you put a Disney song at the end?" They're like, "What do you want?" And they're like, "Whole new world." And they're like, "I guess so." That was Chapek. It had to be Chapek. That's era, what right? happened. Yeah. yeah, it was Chapek era, yeah. but it, I don't know if it was specifically him. I don't know who said it, but that's what happened, right? So. Look, I like Epcot Forever up to that point because that's Epcot's legacy is music. It had a lot of incredible music. That's part of the mystique and aura of yes. that park, right? From the 80s was it had theme songs. Every pavilion had theme songs. And they're these earworms that have stuck with people forever. Right. And they can't get them out of their heads as hard as they try. These weird songs where whatever the subject material was, was the most important thing in, well, the universe, right? So and, and energy, if, energy. Like the guy singing about energy, like it's the love of his life. Yeah. It's amazing. Do you notice that some of the songs go on a little too long? And like Universe of Energy is like one of those, that are, like I'm singing my head, like it's a force beyond. We don't get there. We're just going to change songs. Every now and then it doesn't it Well, doesn't the show's 11 minutes. Right. So you got to right. get, I, I have no problem with the first, the first eight or nine minutes are great. For what they are. I think it's fun. If you grew up loving the park, it's it's such a sweet thing that they basically were like, we're going to give this to you. And it's for us because let's be honest, the tourists stand there and they're like, I don't know what the hell's happening. They know none of the music. They don't know what any of it's from. They, they have little moments where it's like, oh, that's Soren. And then they're lost again. Then they have no idea what's happening again. The Soren inclusion is a little odd too because that came – very long after most yeah, of these but it's beloved still, songs. It's still part of Epcot, and I think it's pretty music, and it's and it's with great the kites, music. I'm not when the kites were in the show, it was like, oh, okay, this is. I'm not denigrating whole new world. It just oh, feels am. super. Yeah, I don't think it's a bad doesn't song. Doesn't belong. There it just show. doesn't belong there. Yeah, Soren is the next yeah. one. It kind of doesn't belong there, even though I love the song. Yeah. You know, it's like you yeah. get those like old. I picture listening to the old Epcot Epcot Center album back in the day, yeah. and all of a sudden that's broken. I look. I at, think. I, I think my point is, though, yeah. that this is made by people who very well may understand Epcot, but it feels like they're people who've been told about Epcot and don't understand why people like it. I think people love the music. I think they got it. I think the, the show was hampered by the ending. Um, I still think it was a mistake in total because I think I think regular guests had no idea what was happening. I don't know if they were just like, ooh, pretty fireworks and people don't actually care, but... I don't know that Epcot. I mean, it had to perform better than Harmonious, but oh, there's um, no doubt about it. I, Harmonious, what a failure! What I like yeah. about Epcot Forever, I feel like Epcot Forever is the first episode of a season of Curb Your Enthusiasm, right? <laughs> Where they start to set up like what's going to go wrong for him yeah. over the course of the season, and it's like, remember what this park used to be? We're going to change everything, and we're using the you know the, it will lead the path. It's the path that'll guide us to the new Epcot, and it'll be a whole new world. And then it's like, it's like Mary Poppins canceled. We're not building that building. Um, it's it's like whole the whole new world is a drop off and pick up area. The fountain we put back in the front. A we rebuilt a building on the site it was in the same shape. Yeah. There's a water walk through and two new rides. And the nighttime show that's going to replace this is not going to make it to the end of the reimagining period. It's actually going to be replaced before we're even done reimagining the park. I didn't intend to get too <clears throat> into this because this is a it is a, a stopgap temporary show. Yeah. There's nothing really to see in this show. So there's no real reason to stop walking. 
So you don't see a lot of people gathered around early to watch Epcot Forever because with Harmonious, I would, to its credit, when I first saw yeah. Harmonious, I didn't. I thought there were some curious choices in terms of yeah. the emotional arc of the show and yeah. kind of where they went. Um, but visually, it was stunning. And I was like, wow, moments, they though. can do some cool stuff with this infrastructure. Yeah. right? They imagine the possibilities with this. Yeah. I think that was cool. It was worth like stopping and looking at. Yeah. Um, obviously, Illuminations, yeah. Illuminations, Reflections of Earth, there's plenty to see. Yeah. I mean, they set Change the hundreds of forever. gallons of fuel on fire. Yeah, yeah. They got the stuff moving in and out. The screen ever yeah. wrapped around a globe had never been done before. Before, right. you know, like we live in a world now where that's ubiquitous or you go to a, a football stadium and there's a screen that the size of which you've never seen before. There's buildings with screens wrapped around them. That wasn't a thing in 1999. It was very hard to do that. We had never seen a screen wrapped around a weirdly shaped structure. Those guys invented that technology essentially. Like that's mm. th that was the wild west at that time. The, you know, torches, we're gonna install torches around the lagoon and there's pyro that's gonna shoot from the shoreline into the lagoon. And there's like these little candles on the water that illuminate and all, like just uh, a so wild cool. show. And, and I like to think like, perhaps we're biased because we know Don Dorsey and he's a, you know, yeah. int really interesting person to talk to, and he knew what he was doing, yeah. right, with this show. They all did. Um, yeah, the, all, that whole team. Gavin Greenaway. Yeah, Gavin, that, that all these people. And yeah. um, and I wonder if they do, if they knew they weren't, that Harmonious was going to fail. Would they have just kept Reflections of Earth going until this new show? Would they still need a stopgap to put more infrastructure uh, yeah. in the water? I don't know, because it looks like every day I go out there, there are more and more docks. Out there, yeah. like there's a lot going on. It's not like harmonious, right? Where it looks yeah. like they're this yeah, setting up a world engine yeah. out there. But I mean, I don't know. It would have been interesting to see if we could have kept reflections of Earth a little bit longer. Yeah, I don't know because I think they were they were so set on and very Chapek era. They were so set on the fact that this show doesn't include our IP and people come here for our IP. And and we saw that you know a couple of weeks ago when they announced that they're going to spend sixty billion dollars. But Josh Tomorrow in the middle of that stood there and said. You know, we see these, you know, financial bursts whenever we use our IP and in, in to build lands and new attractions, right? So that's, you know, that's what they're convinced of. And so they looked at Illuminations, even though it performed really well, they're like, well, it's got to perform better if we use Coco and Princess and the Frog and Frozen and Lion King and, like, that's got to be better. But couldn't you say that make a business case that you see bursts when you put a new attraction in? Does it have to say, do, is there a connection between the IP and, you know, you yeah. put in a new fun roller coaster? They wouldn't know because they haven't built an original attraction in America since Expedition Everest. Right. So who has any idea? I'm pretty sure there was a burst then. That That made Animal Kingdom, you know, finally worth going to for a lot of people. And, and I know this is sad. We have to talk about their, uh, in 2020, I think, late 2019, early 2020, uh, three new films were introduced to Epcot. Yeah. Uh, we had... Which was the part of the expansion where I was like, okay, the, obviously they care if they're going to spend time shooting a new Canada film, and they're going to spend time doing a new film for the land, mm -hmm. and, you know, Beauty and the Beast was, uh, it is what it is. But the other two was like, and then we knew, they had announced they were doing the China film over too. Um, that was another thing that didn't happen, even though it's shot. <laughs> but I, I think at the time I was like, the one that's guaranteed to like, that they, they can hit a home run with is this beauty to be sing along. Yeah, and it's it absolutely like a strikeout. I, yeah. I don't think there's anybody that's, that walks out of that thinking, man, I really, no. I'm really glad I spent my time in here. No. Like, and it's the maybe frozen, as poorly done as you could do a beauty. Yeah. The frozen sing -along. sing along is so well done at oh, studios so and good. it does so much more with so much less yeah. than that. Like they didn't hire Angela Lansbury and they didn't try to animate a bunch of new sequences in the frozen sing-along. They just used live performers and it worked really well. And they're like, we could do this without the live performance money. Let's just animate some new sequences with LeFou and make him a hero. And it's, a, but there are much more fundamental problems with that, right? Than the fact that it's a sing-along, but you've cut out singing this, portions yeah. of songs people love to sing. Bonjour, bonjour, bonjour. Anyway, and it just next cuts, song. Like, yeah. There's more of that song. Yeah. People love this song. This is mainly probably the song people want to sing the most. Yeah. What are you doing? It it I will I will say like 
But there's been plenty of times recently when Disney's done something and we said, this doesn't measure up to the standard they set. Yeah. I don't know that anything they've done has fallen further short of that line than the Beauty and the Beast single one. It's pretty. It's probably it's, the worst attraction at Disney World. It is the worst attraction at Disney World, I think. Awesome Planet is close, but, but Beauty and the Beast is worse. But Awesome Planet, you kind of know you're getting in there to something that's you know, it's not an IP. You know, you're excited about Beauty yeah, and the Beast sing along. Not... My kids know these songs. Yeah. They're going to love this. We're going to go in here. Yeah. And five minutes in, you're like, wow, this is yeah. this is terrible. But it's but Awesome Planet doesn't do its job well, right? Like, I think about Circle of Life. Circle of Life was entertaining, and I feel like it actually taught people things. As opposed to Awesome Planet, which is like, let's talk about biomes. And you're like, this is like first grade I learned this in first grade. Like, He's like a real estate salesman learning. trying to sell a, a planet book, to someone. The premise is a yeah. little weird. Look, I think at times it's it's pretty to look at. It may be stock footage. Imagery's better. Um, it's nice that they put in, you know, 4K projectors and stuff. It's great. I, it's fine. It's not, it doesn't have any repeat, uh, repeatability to me, but no. uh, I've seen it a couple times. It's fine. Yeah, I just. I don't, I don't love it. I don't hate it. I Whatever. I forget that it exists. Yeah. It's not a memorable experience. Um, and. Canada far and wide. Look, I thought the the Martin Short version it's great. Uh, was good, a little corny, oh, lighthearted, but good. Fantastic. And somehow they managed to do something that took itself too seriously, even though it had corny moments. Yeah. And the banter between two amazing actors yeah. who should be hilarious yeah. just falls a little flat, right? Yeah, and the, it's and, very poorly written. And honestly, like they did, apparently didn't have a lot of money. So there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of new footage, but none of it's, almost none of it is 360 degrees. Like they shot very little new circle vision footage. So there's a lot of reused stuff and then new stuff that's low quality. Like it looks like it was shot on an i. It's like iPhone 4K footage, some of the new mm -hmm. stuff. And I'm like, guys, this is real easy to do. Like what? Some of that yeah, early 80s, yeah. like circle vision stuff, though, I think the reason it was cool is because this is cool new technology, and yeah. these people are like, wow, this is so cool. Yeah. I'm going to get the best person on this because they're going to love yeah. having this uh, tool at their disposal. Yeah. And they did all these amazing, well-thought-out shots. Yeah. And I think now when you're like, you've had this technology has been around for a while, you're like, oh, yeah, it's, everybody knows how to use this. We'll just get this guy to do it. I'm yeah. sure he can figure it out. All right. Maybe maybe whoever did it was highly competent. Yeah, I just f feel like the show fell a little flat. It did. So what? It's funny you said that. And like I think that was the thought with China. The the reason they, um, so China was going to be different in that it was going to be the first seamless circle vision. It was right. the, it was the reinvention of circle vision. And it actually, I know it sounds like that wouldn't be hard to do. Apparently, it was a very big challenge to get that to happen. And they worked with Panasonic, who's their projector uh, vendor. They have they have a mm -hmm. corporate alliance with them. Um, that was a big ordeal to get that to work, and they finally did figure it out, and they shot the China film, and then it's – we don't know what happened to it. It just doesn't – the reason it happened there, though, was apparently between the Panasonic deal and um, and apparently the Chinese government paid paid off the project. So that's mm -hmm. who was funding it. Disney didn't have to pay to do it, which is why Canada far and wide got reshot as you know, regular circle vision, and yet China was going to be this big new – Thing and you may remember you've seen footage from it if you ever went into the Epcot yeah. experience they had several seconds of clip of the of the film and it looked great it looked it, just in that little space yeah. it looked phenomenal they had it in semi seamless circle vision in that room um, it looked cool and then they just decided like uh, I don't know if it's because they're afraid American audiences after COVID were you know uh, not going to come see a China film or what the case might have been. I mean, we'll see something because eventually when the internet figures out how to Google Lee Bai, the subject of the current film, yeah. and to look him up, he'll get canceled. You know, look yeah. that guy up a little bit. Whew. I'm surprised that film has yeah. lasted as long as it has. I love it. It's my guilty pleasure at Epcot. Yeah. The China film, uh, Reflections of China. I like it too. Um, mm. Yeah, it's, it's just weird and interesting and semi-offensive. It's like the country bears of Epcot. I'm like, I'm on board. I'm <laughs> on board with this. Um, no, but it'll be interesting because uh, supposedly the word on the street was – um, the reason the Chinese government paid for it is because it's also supposed to be installed somewhere in Shanghai Disney, but that hasn't happened yet either. So we'll see. I mean, the footage exists. They went and shot it. When when it will ever happen or air, you know, we'll wait and see or if it's just going to sit in the Disney vault till the end of time. I look forward to that day. 
Yeah. But see, like that, that's, it's the, this, this reimagining full of broken promises, right? The Mary Poppins thing, the China film, some big things and some very little things. And the, the China film is one of those I think people forget about. I think once once we found out that the Mary Poppins attraction was just going to be some flat spinner, I was like, oh, whatever. We said that initially yeah. before before Dick Van Dyke was on the stage. We told people it was a spinner. They, I don't know what – we said indoor spinner. Yeah. I know, but I think people still thought maybe it will be some kind of a dark ride. Maybe you'll get to ride the horses. Maybe you'll – you know, all these things. Yeah. And it was kind of like an indoor spinner. And uh, it's – look, I would love to have a Mary Poppins attraction. I mean, at the very There's, least, that street would have been cool, right? I think just the – it was cool that they were going to turn that street back there yes. into Cherry Tree Lane. That alone I was on board with. You know my dream. A roof uh, – three times a day rooftop chimney sweep dance show. Hey, that'd be great. Up on the roofs. What do you think? That's the have stuff. Have guys on trampolines and they disappear. Like that's the, the stuff I think we don't even think about yeah. here and really kind of everyone doesn't. I thought – so when they built New Fantasyland, I think I expected that – like Bell and Gaston would roam through the village, and maybe there'd be windows on the upper levels that uh, actors would pop out Marie, of, and they the do baguettes. they do yeah. the scene a couple yeah. times a day, and I'd be like, that'd be amazing. Like, yeah. really go for it, make it like you're stepping into the movie. And then when Japan built the Beauty and the Beast area, and the buildings were eight times the size, I was like, well, for sure they're gonna do it. They didn't do it either. And some it felt like, oh, like that, that'd be cool. And in that same vein as your idea for the yeah. chimney sweep thing, I think that would, stuff like that, like people would die to just see those moments in real life, those indelible movie moments brought to life, right? I made this up years ago, but they can use my idea for free. I think it's great. Yeah. Chimney I'm, sweep show. I'm sure it's been pitched. I'm sure it exists somewhere. Someone said it and someone went, too exp that's too expensive. <laughs> Didn't do it. <laughs> was the attraction going to go in the show place? Is that no? Where was it going to go? Well, there's not there's, a lot of there's space some space there. there. There's enough space for a teacup ride. Yeah, yeah. I guess that's that's all. It wasn't much of anything. I mean, yeah. I and people were excited. I was like, we told you it's a spinner, and then that art finally came up. People were like, oh, it's a spinner. I was like, yeah, we we told you that five years ago. Um, you know. Well, let's go to the present day. What we have now in World Showcase is, I think, more than half the time, a festival going on. Yeah. We have temporary booths that might as well be permanent. Yeah. Right? They kind of are. That no. grease building's been there for a long time. They move it out every now and then, but... I'm trying to figure out by grease building, you were talking about the grease <laughs> booth or, or the refreshment port. I thought you were talking about <laughs> yeah, the, the Danny Zuko meet and greet. No, I call the refreshment, yeah. refreshment <laughs> port, I call the grease building. Anything greasy, they serve out of there. And I realize those festivals are extremely profitable. They wouldn't keep yeah. doing them and making them longer and longer and adding yeah. more. And I I, I don't know how many weeks out of the year we don't have a festival now. Yeah. What it would do, Not did, many. We went through this the other day. You have no festival or, from um, for a couple days between in February between in February and March between FOTA and and, and uh, flower, and flower garden. garden, right? Yeah. You have now you have like three, three to four weeks almost between flower and garden and and uh, food and wine. And food and wine now yeah. that that extended this year a little bit. It was July fifteenth for a couple of years. Then holidays, and then you have you have like a week or so between uh, food and wine and festival of the holidays, and then you have like two weeks between fest. Yeah, so you're way over half the year. A majority of the year is festival. I don't think that's the problem. I don't think, I think in a lot of ways it's the solution, right? I think it means Epcot is a very profitable park and it means more love should be shown to it than has been in this expansion. This park makes a ton of money. And so why not believe in it and put more in it and put more capacity so there's things to do. People don't have to ju just go booth to booth. Give them actual attractions and entertainment and things to do other than clog up the promenade and, you know, you don't make more money if the line is longer for a food booth, right? If, if the, if the f line for the food booth is 50 people deep or 20 people deep, your capacity is still the same. You're rolling through the same amount of people in that time. Why not have some people out there doing something fun rather than I don't just think they piling need it. up? I don't think they need it, right? But then people- They I make think, the same amount I of money. I think they do though. I think because people have a bad time. I think with some festivals, people have a bad time at them because, you know, 
they come on a Saturday to food and wine and it's crowded and miserable, right? If there was more to do, it could be more enjoyable. And, you know, when people are happier, they spend more. I don't know if they know that. I think it's well proven. There was a time about 10 years ago where food and wine was something I circled on my calendar. Yeah. Right? I would I wouldn't miss food and wine festival. And it has become a, a thing. And, and look, it's more popular than it's ever been. Yeah. But it's become this thing that is just something I, I no longer enjoy. Yeah. Right? I don't enjoy going there on a Saturday and waiting in crazy long lines with uh, often loud people, the yeah. huge groups. You know, and to stand outside and eat in a hundred degrees. Yeah, un, you know, not enough real infrastructure for a real food festival. Fight for a table, right? Fighting for tables, fighting for space. How are there still fights for tables? How have they not just gotten more tables at this point and just decided, like, you know what? Yeah, some of it takes up the fireworks viewing, but so what? Just just leave it. You know. Yeah, uh, you would think so, right? They have they have two large boat dock areas that are unused. Yeah. They could fit a few tables there. There's yeah. places to. There's places to put people. Yeah, I don't know. They they choose not to, and and maybe it's because they don't have to. There might be a there might be a reason why. They might have a, some yeah. some reason why. Whether it's uh, additional requirements of custodial staff to clean those tables, which let's be real, nobody's cleaning those tables very often. <laughs> yeah, because there's no time to right. The second yeah. someone leaves one, someone's back at it. Yeah, I don't know. It would be nice if they look. This festival has become permanent at this point. The yeah. illusion uh, that we're bringing in all this temporary infrastructure yeah. is is kind of ridiculous at this yeah. point. Maybe that's the next step. Maybe they'll start. It building is. It's already happened, right? Again. There are there are permanent structures that are festival booths, right? Yeah. I think about shimmering sips or pineapple promenade or whatever you want to call Future it. Future swirl. That, no. that was like a that. I mean, that wasn't built for the festival, but yeah. that used to be like a food kiosk, and then it just became a permanent festival thing. Same with refreshment port. Yeah. Like they that became a festival building. Starbucks. The Starbucks. Yeah. The Starbucks Future structure. Swirl. That's why I said Future Swirl. Yeah. The Starbucks structure now is is gonna is a permanent structure that'll be home new food booths from festivals. Yeah. Not to be confused with swirls in the water, which yeah. somebody in the comments on a recent video thought I had said squirrels on the water oh. and was Googling that to see if that was really I'll a thing. Be your squirrel on the <laughs> water. God. Um, no, and think about, like, I remember when I started going to food and wine, all, almost all the booths looked the same. They were the same structure painted a different color. And then right. suddenly Except over time Greece. they were like... Greece has always been that it's white. It's always been the, yeah. yeah Santorini um, looking... Probably yeah. not originally, but but for a long time. No, but I remember when Africa became like the the, the thatched roof thing. Yeah. I was like, oh, that's cool. And suddenly a bunch of them became like permanent. They became like really cool looking. I was like, this is nice that they started making these look thematic. Like Spain looks like you're you know in the region. They're they're nice. Um, and then they started just overlaying them for other festivals. So there's like the Australia booth that. Is also deconstructed dish, and the, yeah, it just yeah, yeah. gets a new decal every every event. But. I mean, to me, because we cover this um, for a living, the the festivals, with the exception of Festival of the Arts, yeah. I think they become somewhat indistinguishable to me. Right, the yeah. foods all seem kind of like the same thing. They're not, but I mean, it's yeah. just kind of like you know, fest you eat festival food all day, it all just starts yeah. tasting like, especially the drinks, right? The pre made the yeah. premix drinks, they all just start kind of tasting like. The same thing all day long, yeah, I don't and like and it's hard for me to tell the festivals apart. They kind of run together now. I can't remember the last time I had a cocktail. It might have been the, I forget what the what the chocolate cocktail was from like Ireland. There's a Bailey's shake there. That thing, yeah, yeah. that's been there forever now. Like that's yeah. that. Whenever that debuted was the last time. That was the last time I think I had a cocktail. I was like, wow, this is really good. That you know, I I think that's the booth I haven't been to. This they year, haven't changed the menu. The fisherman's ages. pie came back a couple years ago yeah. and it's back. And the and the Bailey's shake that yeah. should be the best booth there every year. I just need to, I yeah. need to get motivated and and go check it out. I think maybe we didn't eat at it because nothing. We new. were reviewing only new food. Yeah, because we already have photos and video of the old stuff. Yeah, correct. So it's okay. The Italy booth always has something new for us to try. Although this year didn't we? No, this year we didn't say that it was okay. It was it, we said it was okay, which is I mean gold that, star. It was better than you. Someone there definitely has been listening because the last two festivals it seemed like a, a minuscule effort was made. But um, I don't want to. We're talking about the reimagining of Epcot. I don't know that any of this applies to that. We should probably no. But I think it's important to context of yeah. the park and what what 
um, the park needs. So knowing yeah. all these things and having all yeah. these things, they say, okay, it's time to reimagine Epcot. Yeah. We know that we have these festivals, they're moneymakers. We know that this is a thing and the park has kind of morphed from being one thing to another. Yeah. So where do we start? Well, one of the things they said, we talked to a festival manager, and I think they said this in a presentation, was how do you pull the pressure of the festivals back? So how do you pull that down in the park? So the, the question became, you know, World Showcase is overwhelmed. How do we take some of the pressure of the festival into future world, right? And that was a big thing for a couple of years, right? Wonders of Life became the festival center for, for a number of years. Um, they started putting booths in Future World, which was another big yep, thing. Yep. And so that was the not focus. Not too deep. No, not too back, too far back into uh, towards the ex exit, right? Yeah, they never crossed kind of the, that. Yeah. They never crossed that central plateau, right? The, right. the middle point, like Mission right. Space and yeah. Land. It never crosses that point. Um, but yeah, that became the thing. And, and that's, I think that's been clearly a focus, right? They're like, well, we're going to keep the festival center up here. We'll build a new one. They didn't build the one they intended to build, but they're building something um, that will serve that purpose in Communicore Hall and Communicore Plaza, um, which is good. I think permanent either way. Like, look, I would have liked the other building, the the three story, you know, mega structure that was heavily advertised. I I, um, I I thought it looked cool. I know a lot yeah. of people thought it ruined Epcot. I thought like it. No, I think it worked. If you're going to do it, do it right. And I it think it was cool. I was like. Picturing being up there yeah. for a show or, you know, for oh, fireworks amazing. or something. That, that like, view. Yeah. We, one thing the parks, there are a couple of Disney parks where there are severe elevation changes and they are, it makes them the most amazing Disney parks in the world. I think spe uh, specifically Disney Sea does it a lot. Disney Sea, like you walk into Mysterious Island and there are levels right. of Mysterious Island and you have this high vantage point. You look down and there's boats going by and there's people eating on the water level and there's rides down there and there's rides up top and there's then above you there's stuff happening. Um, and Disneyland Paris has a bit of that going on too. There are definitely lands that are have kind of levels to them. Not as not as much as Disney Sea, but the Disney World parks don't have a lot of that, right? Like Disney World was developed and Magic Kingdom was developed in the 70s. That they were, it, it's not a particularly great era of design. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it wasn't a particularly great era of design, so they didn't do a lot of that. Um, and then um, Epcot was built sort of flat because Epcot wasn't meant to be thematic. Epcot's meant to be a permanent World's Fair, right? More of the thematic stuff is in the back of World Showcase. But, um, you know, it would have been cool. I think it would have been great to have this elevated. Think about, if you ever been to the DVC Lounge or went up to sure. Imageworks when it was up there above Imagination. Yep. The views, cheese it's man. The cheese it's. The, the views are incredible. Like you look out across Future World, oh, like, this is cool. That's what I meant, guys. The the, the view <laughs> the and gummy the bears it's. were the thing yeah. people used to go crazy about. Um, but yeah, think about how cool that would have been to be up on that third level, and there's trees and greenery up there. But then look out at World Showcase to look out at Future World right. to look out across the Disney World property. Even um, that would have been super cool. And it was a cool looking building. It at least looked futuristic. It wasn't a cookie cutter building. It wasn't a, a plain shape, you know? Um, yeah, no, it was, I thought it was cool. I'm, I'm sad it didn't happen. And it's, it is comical though that in the end they're like, okay, we're just going to build a new structure in the shape of the Communicore building that once stood here anyway. So I think I would like to have been there to take notes on this meeting when this got yeah. killed, right? Because was there another reason to demolish that building first of all? The yeah. old Communicore yeah. building. No, um, there wasn't. Because they kept the possible. other side. Maybe it had no. asbestos. No, no it didn't. No, because no, they kept yeah. the left side. Yeah. It was the same building, same, all built at the same time. Um, so they kept the two buildings on the left, and that became Creations and Connections. The other side was demolished because they were like, oh, we're going to do this uneven thing. It's going to we'll have these structures on this side, and then the other side will have a festival building and the Moana walkthrough and more gardens and green space. And They needed a way to fill in the gardens and green space that they wanted in the center. Yeah, it's sad when something, when there's something big, that they're a big project, yeah. and then it just doesn't happen yeah. for whatever reason. We'll never know all the details of why it yeah. didn't happen. I assume it's bu just budget, but you yeah. think about... Um, uh, if you've been coming to Disney World a long time, the old Crossroads, right? Yeah. Like one of the biggest eminent domain cases ever. Yeah. That was developed by Disney originally. Uh, and they, the Florida wanted this for the I-4 expansion. Spent $165 million buying this place. It's bulldozed. It's yeah. gone. It's leveled. And then they go, eh, yeah. never mind. We're not going to do it. Yeah. Right? 
It's like reflections. just demolished all of this, and then it's just gonna be the same. Reflections. They they yeah. ruined essentially ruined Fort Wilderness. Like they took the wilderness away to clear that site for reflections, and then we're like, eh, you know what? Even though DVC is a proven commodity and this will sell out, eh, maybe not. And then they said, but how can we ruin it more? <laughs> And now you How have about the cabins, DVC cabins, cabins yeah. that look like prefab modules from the future. <laughs> yeah. uh, that's another conversation we can we'll, have. We'll talk night. about that one. We'll get, we'll sure get there eventually. There'll be a DVC episode, I'm sure. So Epcot has been uh, obviously a running joke. It's been torn apart forever. right? I, the big hole in the middle. The big the, hole. The, so the 20, 2020, um, I think, like is when the Pin, Pin Central closed. 2019. Right? September of 19. No, that's not true. September of 19. No, it's not true. I know. I was the last guest. I'm aware of what I didn't closed. work here until 2020. Pin Central closed in September of 2019. How much do you want to bet? <laughs> How um, much okay, because I didn't work here until February I have of the, 2020. I have the final. I was the final guest. I bought a pin. I have my receipt. Okay, look it up. And it's it's on a shelf in my in my home. We might have to cut this out. I don't know. No, Depends we'll leave this in. Make it. Pin Central closes. I'll look for our story. I'll find it. Final look at the iconic Pin Central. Oh, maybe it was later. February 15th? 2020, yeah. Get out of here. Better try to start working here. What closed? It? Something closed in September. Hold on. Was that... Fountain I don't know, View? but I'm going to bask in this for wow. a moment. Wait, was Woo! it Fountain View and the, and the light up pavement closed in September? Closes. <laughs> yes. Was that the same day? Yes. No, September 7th. That's why I was confused. Colortopia, Club Cool, Fountain of Nations, uh, all closed on September 7th of 2019. Yeah. So that whole Fountain View, all that closed. Yeah, Penn Central was a holdout with Electric Umbrella. Those closed. Those closed. I there. recall because uh, in the roast of Tom Corliss, I didn't know you very well at the time, but I was called upon to roast you anyway because I was new on staff. Yeah. And my uh, joke was that you went to Pin Central because uh, you wanted to be the last person to buy a pin. Yeah. And the cast members, the feeling was mutual that you were the last person that they wanted to see. Yeah, that's <laughs> That was a good one. Oh, those are the days. The old roast. Getting old, Corals. I don't remember things anymore. But yeah, yeah I knew something. Up, I knew something closed in that area in September of, of nineteen. I had to go look at my receipt again. So it's been closed forever. Obviously, they couldn't anticipate the uh, scope of a global pandemic. All these things that have been uh, kind of used as a pretense to get rid of all kinds of stuff or not do a bunch yeah. of stuff. Um, but twenty nineteen was also when they announced. Uh, Moana Journey of Water, uh, or Journey of Water inspired by Moana, because we have to have a colon and everything, right? Yeah. Um, and that was set to open for the 50th anniversary. I don't know that they ever said that was 50th. They did say that. No. I Googled it today. Did they really? Yeah. The things I know were definitely 50th, right? So what ended up being 50th was Harmonious and Ratatouille. Those were supposed to open in 2020. Right. Harmonies and Ratatouille should have opened in 20, and then in 21 for the 50th should have been Guardians and Play and I forget what. And Journey I, of Water inspired yeah, by really? Moana. I'm, I'm almost positive. But the that, festival building wasn't supposed to be done. How could that, Eric, how could they have had Moana open a year later? They didn't even finish demolishing They anything. announced it in 2019. Yeah. Uh, set to be open at the end of 2021. That's... Not that hard to build I guess what so. it amounts to. I mean, they never is, committed to the festival building being open at that time. I'm not talking about it. the festival building is still not open. Yeah, and like and Journey of thing. Water inspired by Moana, it, we people are experiencing it. Yeah. Um, and so this essentially took longer to construct than the park itself, right? Epcot yeah. was built in less time than it took them to do Journey of Water inspired by Moana. Well, it's the same with Tron, where they just they they decided to stall because number one, they're like. Well, we, we're not going to see an attendance boost from this. We don't need it. Attendance is great right now. But this is considerably a considerably smaller project than Tron. No, but they held both of them. They held right. them. Tron was held because they were like, oh, the writing on the wall is when the 50th is over, attendance is going to be down. So what's our follow-up? What is our follow-up to the 50th? It's, it's, you know, that week they're like, happily ever after comes back and Tron. And hopefully this saved the summer. And now it's like, well, what are we going to do to get people to come for the holidays or for spring next year? 
And it's, well, we have this Disney 100 thing at Epcot and we'll open Moana and this is the time I don't is right. think that's – I mean, I think – I think it will be popular when it opens. People will like uh, Journey of Water. I don't think that someone from Rhode Island is planning a trip around. I mean, there are people, right? There's more chances of drawing people with opening things than not opening things, right? Yeah. You know? So, like, they held it. They held these things through the 50th because it was like Guardians, I think they felt compelled to open because Epcot was a mess. And they're like, something's got to open that people are going to rave about. So let's do this. And then the rest, they're like... We can just wait. Same with Tron. They're like, after Guardians open, they're like, we can just wait. We'll just wait, and this will be next year when we need, you know, when we need to pull. What the term they use is there's levers we can pull, right? Iger and Damar have said that before. There are, there are levers we can pull when we need, you know, bringing pass, annual passes back, turning them off. Like, these are levers we can switch on and Bob off. Bob Chapek said we can pivot on a dime. Yeah. Remember? Yeah. So, I mean, that's, thing, right? that's what they did. Like, Moana could have opened ages ago. They decided they didn't need to. So they didn't care. It was like, we'll hold it. And when when we think we need it, and then they set a time frame, and they're like, okay, that'll be, that'll be fall of 23, and we'll finish Epcot in fall of 23, and that's the big marketing will be. We'll, we'll send the Disney 100 decorations from California. We'll use that as, like, the way to mark the end of the Epcot reimagining Reimagining the end of it is the Disney 100 celebration. Uh, of course, in classic Disney style, we have nothing hitting the deadline. So up to September 22nd th- has come and gone, and still Moana isn't officially open yet. They're still building Communicore Hall and Plaza. Walt the Dreamer is still behind construction walls. There's no you know, show. There's no nighttime show still. So December 5th will be, we assume, if Communicore Hall and Plaza open at that time with, with Luminous. We assume December will be the moment at which the reimagining is complete, the project is done, and they've... they've the walls yeah. come down. Yeah. There are a lot of walls there right now. And I, I have to say, despite all the challenges and problems that we've discussed with Epcot, it is the park I probably go to the most. Yeah. For whatever reason. Rose and Crown. <laughs> it's not just the Rose and Crown, right? It's, oh, not, um, it's not just the Eagle Rare that they sell in tape, Morocco. Right. Gonna... right. Um, there are a number of reasons that we end up going there. A lot of concert. you know, the concerts are a draw, yeah. right? The festival concerts are a draw, um, just kind of going there. It's an easy place to meet friends. Yeah. It You never have trouble getting a park pass until uh, we, what, announced this week that some previews. of their preview dates yeah. are uh, Epcot park passes so are So much for no crazy. one caring about Journey of Water. Oh, it's anything new, but I don't yeah. think that you needed it, right? I don't yeah. – these are probably mostly annual pass holders anyway. Yeah. So there are people that – this isn't more revenue for Disney. Yeah. <laughs> They're not maybe, – maybe selling people – Umbrellas. Maybe they'll get an Oswald cookies and cream milkshake, which is the same cookies and cream milkshake they always have, but with an Oswald chocolate piece on the top. Oh boy, okay, I don't. We could talk for ten seconds. I hate the new Oswald magnet. I love I Oswald. Like I know you. He doesn't work in that art. Style. You're whatever. I hate everything in that yeah, art the style. pie eye. Is it called pie eye? No, or? it's not pie. It's it's the like Ren and Stimpy yeah. weird style. They've Mickey and Minnie have been in for the last ten. But he or also so has pie eyed on this magnet. He I think is. It's so they, it's like it's half 1930s style and half. You know, modern Mickey Mouse, and it just doesn't. He doesn't look right. Though. It doesn't work. It doesn't it's like work Figment. I didn't like the Figment one either. I was like, Ugh. no, the Figment one was a little weird. Yeah, and I didn't even bother going to get that. Please one. stop making characters in this style. Can we in 2024? Can we pick a new art style for pass holder magnets? Please, thank you. They have. I you know I didn't want to get I didn't want to derail us too much on that because we we're talking about important we'll stuff. We'll get derailed but those, on something else. But. But I guess my problem coming to the park is the walls, right? Yeah. If especially when you when you go on the uh, west side when you come in, so uh, as you enter the park, you go to the right towards seas with Nemo yeah. friends. Um, that passageway is getting narrower and narrower. I mean, last yeah. night uh, we went and people had umbrellas, and I had an umbrella, and someone coming the other direction had an umbrella, and they, hit. And they like hit. It's right. that narrow, right? Yeah. They're the, the the walls are taking up more and more yeah. space, and all around the park, you know, even all the way down uh, between um, between Imagination Pavilion and uh, the new the old Starbucks now swirled Unicor- showcase yeah. that area that construction walls up there. They're oh, just that, that like new festival space. There. Yeah, whatever they're doing there, uh, and it just doesn't feel right. It doesn't feel like a premium experience. And I'm an annual yeah. pass holder, and I'm kind of numb to the uh, incremental increases to annual pass. Uh, costs, yeah. but a day guess you're going there and you're paying a hundred and 
150 bucks. Yeah. You know, and you're you're going into this place that's mostly construction walls. Yeah. You know, there's I think it's just part. It's part of the Disney parks, right? Like I, I think we've been around long enough where we've seen it, right? We saw. Remember when we used to say that about Hollywood Studios? And now, like because we miss construction walls so much, they've put a permanent one up at Keystone Clothiers. No, just it's so down. We can remember. It's down. No, it's still mostly there. There's just a doorway in the middle of the wall now, but it's still there. Um, no, it, I remember like that park was all construction walls for ages. Then finally, yeah. it was. It was finally done, and that was it. And the walls went away, right? And the same thing will be Epcot. Is is we're reaching the point at which that'll that'll be the end of that era. California Adventure. There was a several. My first several years of going to that park was it was a maze. It was a mess. Um, it's it comes with the territory of redoing a park, which is something right. that has been common in the Iger years of the Walt Disney Company. Well, I mean, going back to the origins, that, that Disney was going to be a place of. Uh, Always in a state of becoming? Is that what it yeah, is? Yeah, no, people yeah. forget, like, when Walt Disney yeah. was alive, there was a point. If you went to Disneyland in 1966, think about this. All of Tomorrowland was in ruin as they built new Tomorrowland. And on the other side of the park, they were building New Orleans Square and Pirates of the Caribbean. So on both sides of the park were construction walls with major, like, huge size projects. Now, right? Honda so Mansion sat there for years, yeah. empty. Right. Oh, but, the, but the once they decided to do something, they got stuff done quickly. And the yeah. reason they did that is because the future, you know, the company's money was all tied up in getting these things done, so that people would come. Oh, to but the, the park. pirate ditch was there forever. Yeah, but yeah. But, so like people in the '60s probably are the same way we talk about Epcot is the way people talk about the ditch where Pirates of the Caribbean exists now. And I mean, look what no one talks about that anymore. It's just oh, that's Pirates of the Caribbean. Now look, I'm not saying anything in the center of Epcot is going to be Pirates of the Caribbean because it's not. But, like, it's, there's a long history of it. I think we get stuck a little bit on it sometimes. But to your point, they've done a lot of studies and surveys since the DCA overhaul. And the truth is that it's very hard to draw attendance when you have a lot of construction walls up in the park because people do feel like, oh, wait, I want to come back when this park is done. It, it feels bad because my first impression when I walk in the park is bad. And my last impression as I leave the park is bad. Yeah. And everything that happened in the middle is, seems to be okay. Yeah. Um, you know, with the exception of there's not a whole lot, a lot, a whole lot of rides. But I think it was worse at one point, right? Because there were the Remy construction walls. Harmonious was being built in the middle of the lagoon, right? Like, Remy so was out of the you way. You couldn't though, even then. escape. Yeah, but the Harmonious work right in the middle. You couldn't escape the Epcot construction the first, you know, two years of the project. Well, I mean, even even today, there's plenty of construction going in on the in again, the lagoon again. Yeah, right? the absolutely. lagoon is a constant yeah. construction. But site. it looks better, even though it's an active construction site. And Guardians went on forever, but it was kind of tucked yeah. away. And, and That side was dead. And I think that's the first thing we touch on when we talk about the re reimagining of Epcot as it has come to its fruition. No. It has to be Guardians of the Galaxy Mission. The most successful the, the, aspect. The, the shops, sure. okay, I know people had a lot of fond feelings for Electric Umbrella, which I did yeah. too, even though it was kind of dingy and gross. Yeah. Um, same with Mouse Gear. It was. Yeah. I, I have fond memories of the place, but I also have memories of hating that yeah. place. You know, I don't, I'm not a big fan of I, uh, connections and yeah. creations, but I understand it. I, I don't like it. the interiors. I do love that they open up the windows, though. I think that is one change that will remain through the, you know, through our lifetime at Epcot. Those windows will now all remain open, and that's great. Like, seeing the monorail go by, yeah. and it was a mistake in, in the 90s to close all the windows up, essentially. That was a big mistake. Um, now, you know, could they improve upon the flooring, the displays, all that stuff in both of those venues, yeah, for sure. It looks a little airporty, and, and um, you know the the new uh, Delta terminal at LAX looks a hell of a lot like Connections. Yeah, there's a lot of the same flooring, and you know it's it's like uh, I don't know. It, it makes it not feel very Disney, but I get it. Um, but so we have now Cosmic Rewind, yeah. right there when you walk into park. Basically, you see yeah. it from the parking lot. Yep. And, um, you know, I think it's a fun ride. I really like yeah. it. I think it's a well-done ride. I think they did a good job. I enjoy it. It feel it has a certain Disney feel to it where it's um, it's got a little bit of polish to the to the way it's done. Uh, yeah. As opposed to, like, I love Velocicoaster, but it doesn't feel – it feels like – Yeah, Velocicoaster feels like it could exist at Cedar Point. Right. And Right, as opposed to Guardians feels like, yeah, I mean, it's it's modern Space Mountain. 
Right. I re- look, there's been criticism of the finishings look like they come from Ikea. And now anybody can look up on the internet where a light fixture came from and all that, all those yeah. things. But I still feel like they made a sincere effort to do something it's that's fun, cool right? and will endure and that people will enjoy. Yeah. Does it fit at Epcot? No, it doesn't. But I don't think they care. It was where no, they had the they space. Don't. It's where they needed an attraction. Yeah. Uh, someone pitched an idea. They they could have made that a, uh, you know, a Big well, Bang was, coaster. It was or, supposed yeah. to be an Epcot ride, right? Yeah. Big Bang coaster was yeah. supposed to be non-IP. And the question is, like, would it have drawn differently? I am, I'm so curious, right? Because I think... I think the way IP IP attractions draw is different from the way non-IP attractions draw, right? If we want to go back to the 60s and talk about Pirates of the Caribbean and Haunted Mansion, right? I don't know that they immediately, like, saw the full effect of both of those opening, right? I think if you lived in the Southern California area, you absolutely went to check those out pretty immediately. But I think as far as, like, I think it took several years before like word got around as more and more people saw those attractions. Then people are like, you got to go to Disney World and Disneyland. You're like, why? Like, they have this ride called Pirates of the Caribbean and the pirates are alive and they're, they're shooting at each other and they're dunking the mare in the well and all these things. Like, I think it's a word of mouth thing, right? The news traveled differently back then. That doesn't exist anymore, then. yeah. It, things, things were different then, right? But that's what would happen, right? So look look at it. We can bring in a modern example that proves that this still happens, right? Hong Kong Disneyland. Hong Kong Disneyland opens. It's kind of a park on the cheap. It doesn't do well. It's failing. And Iger comes in and they decide with Tom Staggs at the helm, we're going to put a bunch of money in Hong Kong Disneyland. And two of the things they decide, they, they build a Toy Story land, which is very, it's a bunch of carnival rides essentially. Um, but they decide that's going to be one part of the expansion. The other two parts of the expansion, though, they're like, we're going to build original new attractions. We're going to build a small frontier land with a new type of roller coaster. We're going to build uh, a bear-themed roller coaster. Then we're going to build a Disney-style classic dark ride in the vein of Pirates and Haunted Mansion um, with new original characters right in the middle. And what happened was... Uh, Hong Kong Disneyland turned profit for the first time in its existence upon the opening, not of Toy Story Land, but of Grizzly Gulch and Mystic Manor, two original attractions. And you know what? The amount of tourism they got over the years because of those two attractions, people, the word of mouth, people are like, you got to go to Hong Kong. Why? You're like, well, the park's kind of small. There's not a lot to do, but these are two of the best Disney rides I have ever seen. And yeah. that's that's why every you know every American or you know European or whatever Disney fan that's been to Hong Kong that's probably the reason they went. I know that's why I went. No, I, I it, Hong Kong would not be on my radar no. if not for Mystic Manor. No, right? absolutely not. Yeah. Right. So there's still something to be said that it can be done. Right. So if they had built the Big Bang coaster, it probably wouldn't have had the crowds in May of 2022 that Guardians did. But over time, I think the crowds would have been the same in the long term yeah. because people would have said, have you been on that? You're like, that Big Bang roller coaster? Like, it's amazing. And I think people would have still, because someone told you there's this amazing roller coaster, I think people would have shown up, right? People still show up at Cedar Point and all these other places for unthemed roller coasters. People are going to show up if you tell yeah. them there's a good roller coaster at Disney World. It happened with Space Mountain. It was what Space Mountain was. People were like, you got to see this thing. I think it's a surprise and delight too, right? So if you have a premium movie franchise that's like, you know, a multi-billion dollar franchise at this point, yeah. and your expectations are going to be very high as a guest coming in there that you're going to get this premium experience. But if you have something else that has a premium experience that's original, that has like some kind of uh, uh, ability to connect with people that is beyond what you could do with a movie franchise. There's a magic to it, yeah. Right. Look at Figment, yeah. We're seeing that yeah. magic, right? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. The Church of Imagination is growing every day. Yeah. But look at Mansion. I mean, that's all organic, right? Like, Mansion now has its own... St- they had to add stores to both of the U.S. ones. The merchandise... You can now buy Haunted Mansion merchandise at Lowe's. I know. Right? Like, that's... That's not because they ever made a movie. That's not because of anything else they ever did with the Haunted Mansion. That's because people fell in love with Haunted Mansion. Like, that's that amazing ride from Disney World we went on. Right. And that's the reason people at Lowe's, people walking in Lowe's, they're like, oh, I know that. That's Haunted Mansion, right? That 
can be figment, that could be mystic manner, that could be any of these things, but no one wants to believe in that anymore, right? And that's that's my problem with the Epcot expansion is that no one wanted to believe that you could do a modern version of old Epcot and that it would work, right? I'm not saying you need to build a bunch of slow moving omni mover rides that are purely educational. That's not what I'm saying, right? But the fact that when they came out and said, oh, it's gonna be just a roller coaster about the Big Bang, I'm like, yeah, that's yeah, great. Or when we had Tim Delaney here, a uh, former yeah. Imagineer, um, for the Epcot 40th event we did. I went on he, his very first ride did. of Guardians of the Galaxy Cosmic Rewind. Yeah. Um, but at that event, he he was like, I have this art, and no one's ever seen this before. But towards my last few years in Imagineering, I actually went to the Universe Energy, and I drew up a plan to replace it. And it was this modern version of Adventure Through Inner Space, where you essentially got shrunk and sent into the into inner space, into the microverse, um, in a roller coaster type ride. And I'm like, that's great. That's reinventing number one, something from Disneyland um, in a in a way that would excite a modern audience. Number two, it's original content. And and number three, it's true to the vision of Epcot. There's for every like this is the most incredible idea. Why this should have happened. This is what Epcot is, and this was what modern Epcot could be, right? Because test track. I know a lot of people are mad that World of Motion closed, but the reason people don't talk about World of Motion as much as they talk about Horizons and Figment is because the thing that replaced it was kind of cool. And it still was kind of an Epcot thing, right? Like Test Track was still educational. It's like, we're gonna take you in. You, the world has never been allowed into a, into a motor vehicle testing facility to see what how the car you drive every day is, is tested and made. We're gonna have a ride where you live that experience. You are a crash test dummy. And it was it was a fantastic. It was like this, and it felt like Epcot. There was no moment in that ride where I was like, this doesn't belong here. As opposed to Guardians, where I'm in the queue and they're like, let's learn about this, let's learn about Xandar and yeah, this yeah. large city, this large imaginary city. And I'm like, this is the this is mocking what a Epcot whole fake is. museum yeah. of art. Mocking Epcot. And- mocking the thing your company's founder believed in, right? And you could, I know someone's gonna go into the comments and be like, he wanted a city anyway, it doesn't matter. That's, that's, but part of that was also he, he believed in getting people inspired and optimistic about the future, right? And the future of, of industry. In fact, like there, yeah, there was Epcot the city, but there, were, there was still the industrial sector he wanted to build. He wanted you to be able to visit these factories, these plants, these businesses, from big American corporations and go see how the sausage was made, right? That was, Epcot always had that. And Epcot had international areas too, where you could go, you know, a little, like a little Irish village and go to a, go to a, you know, a little UK village, go to a pub. That was all in that Epcot city plan, right? So like, yeah, Epcot the city didn't happen, but a lot of the stuff Walt envisioned for it was very much what Epcot Center was. It just was missing the residential component, right? Um, so like the fact that the matter of fact is that still guardians, like while it's fun and while it's a great roller coaster and very innovative, it, it is, it's a mockery at Epcot. It, it makes fun of the, your own company's legacy is being made fun of and everyone just, and that's why I titled the review. You may remember I titled it go dancing, dancing on Epcot's, Epcot's grave. grave. Yeah. Cause that's what it is. It's like, yeah, this is super fun, but who cares what this park's about? I don't care. Yeah, and th- there's also something to be said for if they had done something original. I yeah. think people make connections with these things, and that's yeah. why there's a wide array of merchandise at, at Walt Disney World, yeah. right? Because people take ownership of something. They go, Stitch people are Stitch people, right? They ride or die with Stitch. Yeah. Jake, he's buying yeah. Stitch merchandise if it comes out. Yeah. I used to be, Man- Mansion didn't have as much merchandise back in the day, so I would collect Mansion merchandise. Now it's so commonplace that I don't even bother buying. <laughs> People's like, I got this Haunted Mansion thing. I'm like, eh, yeah. it, it doesn't really... It, it's not the same as it used to yeah. be, but people can, Mr. Toad, right? All these little things that you can do that people identify with. They had Country a little bears. piece, of, right? A little piece of them is connected yeah. to that original IP. Yeah. And while I'm sure they sell a lot of Guardians of the Galaxy merchandise, I feel like people probably don't have that same sense of ownership when they come off that ride that like, yeah, yeah that's like my People thing. didn't wait seven hours to buy that Disney Skyliner popcorn bucket with Guardians of the Galaxy decals on it. People waited for Fig. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Figment. He resonates with people. Like, look, I don't doubt they sell a lot of Guardians of the Galaxy merchandise, but I think they still undervalue 
they undervalue original content and they are afraid that they're afraid to take the chance, right? I think they believe like Guardians is a safe bet. We know we could stock right. that store and Guardians merchandise is going to sell in there. But there's no guarantee that we're going to create an original character so, that resonates with people, right? So let's go through this exercise then. Would Future World be better off with an empty Wonders of Life pavilion or with a strong IP-based blockbuster movie anchor attraction in there? Because you've already like kind of diluted the, the, the message and vision of Epcot. Yeah. Uh, would it be better to have something there, or would you would not you rather play. not have play? Was weird. No, not play. I'm saying, uh, let's pick a movie for I don't know. Grow Grow Goose. Do you want to Grow Goose Wonders of Do you want to pick Inside Out because that's the one that makes sense. Inside Out makes sense as an IP. Um, the Inside Out characters hosting a pavilion about the inside of it's you basically Buzzy 2.0 would be f- yeah. phenomenal. Yeah. Right there's where IP makes sense. Right, you could have built the Big Bang coaster and then next door. Had been like, oh, this is more kid. Fr-. Like that's an adult ride anyway. It's a roller coaster. Right. There's a height requirement, right? So the kids aren't going to look at that and go, "I'm missing out on Guardians of the Galaxy." I'm sure there are kids under that height requirement who are super bummed. They probably love Guardians of the Galaxy. Um, but then you look at that and you're like, "Well, we'll have attractions with no height limit, or attractions with no height requirement inside next door, and it'll be themed to a franchise that probably means more to younger kids." Inside Out. Um, and it actually makes sense. It's actually a movie about inside the human body. Yeah. Like let's let's and how about you want to speak to today's modern audience? Do you know what more so than physical health? Do you know what means something in today's in the discourse today? Mental health. Imagine an entire pavilion about mental health with the inside out characters. I I don't know. I look. I have never. I didn't go to school for this. I. Didn't, <laughs> Like, I went to school for a very different thing. I'm not a designer. I am not a creative person in that respect. But sometimes these things, like, I don't know how they don't think of these things. I think that, too. I mean, if you want to make an impact on people, I think destigmatizing mental health yeah, and would like, be a wonderful thing to do. And you and you soften the topic the same way they soften the topic with making a me with animation, right? You soften the topic with the Inside Out characters, but you use them to teach something very serious, right? And that, that would be the spirit of Epcot, right? It's like, yeah, you did this journey of water inspired by Moana. Mo- the Moana theme in there is not overt, right? There's music, but really each exhibit is not about Moana characters, right? When you go to the the exhibit on, um, I don't even know which one that Lakes. is, where the water raises. Right? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, right? There's no character in the middle of that. Same thing with the one there with are the- characters like carved the in river the river one, right? But, it's yeah. like, yeah, but they're off to the side. Yeah. In the middle of the actual exhibits about each- you know, stage right. of the water cycle, the water cycle is the focus, right? And then the characters are in the background. That's a tasteful way to do that. And that's how the Inside Out could, thing could have been where you could have had an attraction that is the Inside Out characters inside the head and it's funny and, and interesting. But then your exhibits in the middle could be those characters are there, but you're tackling something. You know, these are people yeah. that are taking a few steps off the beaten path into the center exhibits and are like, I kind of want to learn more about this. Yeah. And and you have a you have a My, easy way to connect them. Excellent them. idea, Tom. Um, if we move next door, I think Mission Space it doesn't work for me. I you know Mission I just don't Space, think they'll get rid of it because they have a paying tenant in Space yeah. Two Twenty attached to the building. Yeah. Right? It replaced uh, the the probably the most iconic of Epcot. Um, well, I know you're imagination an imagination right. guy. Jason's a space there's no bird five guy. hour wait for the Horizons meet and greet. <laughs> they floated away. <laughs> but uh, but a big, probably the most ambitious attraction in Epcot's history, right? In terms of the scope and size and it's, expense. It's between and Figment length and of the ride, for right? Sure. This thing that was 17 minutes long or whatever yeah. it was. Um, to be reduced now to a, a spinning centrifuge, I think is a little bizarre. I don't I think, think it connects with people. a little unfair to mission space. Do you think it's in a top in a no, ride that doesn't have many no, it's, many rides? It's awful. It's, Don't get me wrong, yeah. it's awful. But if I'm sitting there in the late '90s and the idea is how do you revitalize Epcot for a modern audience? That number one, their idea is space exploration, right? That's a very Epcot topic, right? They have not right. they have not diverted from what Epcot is, and they're like the same way they're we like, need well, some place track, to sell all the space ice cream. That's with Test Track. They're yeah. like let's with transportation. We're going to kind of take you into 
a place you've never been. You've never gotten to be a part of the the design or the, whether it's the design process or the testing process of motor vehicles, right? In the case of Mission Space Shuttle, you've never gotten to train. You've never, no, normal humans do not get to go train to go to outer space. Is there a way we can build an attraction that is the closest you as a human being can come to going into space without actually doing it? They did that, right? Mission space is cool. It has no emotional connection. It doesn't mean anything to people. But you cannot tell me, I think the first time everyone goes on that who doesn't get sick from it, every time th those people go on it the first time, I think people are like, this is insane. This is unreal. I've never felt anything. No roller coaster. There's nothing that a normal person, that someone on a that goes visits any destination in the world, there's no closer they get to the realism of going to space than they do on that attraction. We can argue if it worked. It clearly does that didn't, make it right? a good attraction. No, yeah. they screwed up. They gave it no heart. They gave it no feeling. It's not a Disney ride. They didn't do a good job executing, but as far as concept, it's very Epcot, and I don't think it was the wrong idea. I think it was, it just didn't work out. People weren't, people weren't ready for it, and then they're never going to be ready for it. It's it's a step too far. It's a cool idea, but a step too far. If that was an attraction at, you know, um, the space center. I think it'd be people would be more prepared for it, and the people that ride it would be super jazzed about it. But I think as a theme park attraction in one of the most visited theme parks in the world, it just doesn't work. I also i I think the idea of motion simulators is kind of uh, not appealing to a lot of people yeah. for a number of reasons. One of them getting sick. I just think you know this is not as bad as something like Fast and Furious Supercharged, yeah. but a screen based motion simulator. Body Wars is a good um, yeah. analog of this or, uh, you know, or Star Tours. These are things that are not, they don't resonate with people. They don't make a deep connection with Oh, this. I don't I agree. Think it's kind of I fun, love Star Tours. I, Star Tours is still my favorite Star Wars ride. I think it captures more of what Star Wars is to me than either of the other attractions. <sighs> Sorry. It has the humor and the heart and that generally I feel is not no, present I, I in think Smuggler's I'm, Run. I, the or ride system itself rides. is what I'm talking about. The ride. Yeah, but it changed the world in 87. I don't, you know, just because it's not revolutionary still, I don't think takes away from Star Tours. I love Star Tours. I think it's great. I like Star Tours, but I mean, the queue and all the setup is more of the, it's in, you know, the interaction as you're getting seated and things like that, I think are more fun than the actual ride. I don't agree with you. Mm -hmm. All right. Although, Lee, I got to tell you, when she's the rebel spy, she gets very excited. I love Star excited. Tours. Boy, I got us off track. I apologize. It's fine. Um, I'm trying to kind of go around the around Future World, though. And look Do we feel like we adequately talked about Guardians? Uh, what more is there to say about I Guardians? I mean, I think it's a very fun ride that doesn't have an Epcot soul to it. Yeah. And... I'm not offended that it's mocking Epcot. I understand your point, and I, I agree yeah. with you to an extent. I also think, you know, it's okay that they're not taking themselves too seriously. That's yeah. kind of fun and lighthearted. I get, I can understand where they were at a crossroads coming up with this cue and story, and we're like, okay, we want to go back in time. Yeah, you know, we want to do all this, and why are we doing this? And then. The, Boom, you have to you have five options for a story and you go, okay, this guy stole this thing. Okay, now let's go back further in the pre-show. What do we have? Oh, they, you know, this thing's broken. It's the thing that helps them travel in time. And then yeah. well, why are they showing these people this thing that's broken? Oh, they are meeting earthlings and yeah. trying to teach them about their world. I get and well, then they tell go, you that they, Oh, that's what Epcot is. Yeah. You know? They had such a problem figuring that out that that ride was under construction before they knew who the villain was. Yeah. They didn't know who the villain Isan was. Isan the Destroyer? That Isan came about. Isan the Searcher. Isan the yeah. Searcher. Which is definitely a reference to Exxon, by the way. Um, it has to be. No, he's a real guy. He's He exists is in he? the universe. Yeah. Oh, does he I'm really? almost positive he exists uh, in the real maybe. universe. But, yeah, no, they, they, I mean, there was a point where that ride had animatronics. There's a point where it didn't. And then they didn't know who the villain was. And all of this was figured out why the thing was being built, which... You know, I don't know. Like, and that's the, the the proof is in the pudding, right? I think it is an extraordinarily fun ride. I don't think the pre-show is particularly good. No, like, but I think the it's story memorable. is terrible. Yeah, 
Because the wall raises? Am I supposed to be amazed by this wall popping up? I don't know. I, I think the thing that's strange, too, maybe it's a missed opportunity, maybe it could have been animatronics or something else, is when you go up right before you launch backwards, you go into the room, you kind of go around, and you, you, you go around yeah. this room that's just like low-pile carpet, like you're in a yeah. high school music room or something. Yeah. Um, I think there's an opportunity there for them to really do something cool, yeah. set pieces or something Well, physical. that's what we said in the, the honest review of Guardians. I said, like, this ride technology is fantastic. I can't wait for someone with a bigger budget to take this and do, like, physical sets and, like... Like, there's a coaster portion, sure, but then the vehicles can spin. So, like, I have a show scene where you face one thing and then you're not expecting it. You turn around, there's something else there, and you yeah. turn... You know, like, there, there's a lot of possibility there. I don't think Guardians will be the best iteration of that ride. I think, um, I don't know if we talk about this, but um, most likely the new Space Mountain in Tokyo is this ride yeah. system, and I think it's going to blow Guardians away because I think it's going to be more logical. I think it's going to make more sense. And they will pull out all the stops. Yeah, they'll spend they the do, money right? for sure, yeah. Uh, it's the same thing, right? It's the first. So you have Test Track, and then you have Radiator Spring. Or no, yeah. after Test Track, I'm sorry, is Journey to the Center of the Earth. Yeah. And Radiator Springs Racers, which are two of the most beloved attractions in the world, in the two, world arguably right? two, the two best attractions ever built, arguably. Yeah, and the same ride system as Test Track, which I love Test Track, but but you don't ride yeah. Test Track and you're like blown away by like what? Well, I current think, Test Track is garbage. It's yeah. hot garbage, and I'm I'm so excited about the update. I'm very excited to see what happens. The idea of what you can do with scenery, like in Radiator Springs yeah. Racers, I haven't done Journey to the Center of the Earth. Yeah, right. Radiator Springs Racers is amazing. You come around the corner and they've got this giant waterfall and yeah. a bridge and you go That's experience great. beautiful outdoor environments. Yeah. You go inside and see all these roads and then you go into Radiator Springs and you go into the tire shop or into the paint shop and yeah. you, you do all these amazing things and then you race. Yeah. And it, it works with the story and everything else. I think that is a, like such a great incremental step that a lot yeah. of people don't even think about it. Like, oh, this is Test Track. Yeah. Right. This is actually same with Journey, where that that's the one where I tell people that, and people have been on it are like, "Oh, I guess it is." Yeah. People don't think about it because the ride is so immersive and incredible and different that it doesn't even strike people that it's the ride system. Yeah. No, I so I I look forward to seeing if they continue to use this. Yeah. Why wouldn't they? Right. This is a great technology. This is way better than some of the other things that they than them copying no the one's same been able ride to do system, it, right? Because yeah. Look at Universal. Like they have a a their biggest franchise, Comcast's biggest IP, is Fast and the Furious. Yeah, and they, for the love of them, cannot figure out how to build a Fast and Furious attraction. Right, Fast and Furious Supercharged is a, a dumpster fire. Yeah. it's garbage to the point which now they're like, they've arrived at the point where they're like, we need a fast. Fast and Furious ride. We need a thrill ride. What are we going to do? And they're like, we don't know how to do. They're like, and same with Mario Kart. Same thing happened where people expected I was gonna say, some same kind of thing. speed. It's... And there's none. And and it's like, well, what are we going to do? And so now they've arrived at this point where they're like, we'll build a Fast and Furious roller coaster. And now we'll we'll rip off the Guardians ride system. So the cars will drift. It'll, they'll spin and drift. Wouldn't it have been a better idea to rip off the test track ride system and you're, but you might get not, a GTO? You that's might the get thing a about Porsche, Universal Creative get, is they don't have the ability to yeah. figure out that ride system. Disney, say what you want about the current creative people at WDI. Their strength for the last so, so ever many years has been the R&D people, the people that create new technology, right? And, and that's always been a strength, right? But now it is solely the strength of this division is they come up with – Guardian's strong point is not the theme. It's not the story. It's not the creative. The strong point is what the R&D department at WDI cooked up, a, a story coaster, a spinning yeah. roller coaster vehicle where you control the spin, right? Those guys are responsible for that success, not anyone who was on the creative side of that attraction. Those people did jack squat, Right? Strong words from a strong man. But the R and D the R and D guys <laughs> the R and D guys killed it, right? And they did in nineteen in the nineteen nineties when they came up with the test track ride system. They're like, we can have a car go sixty miles an hour and it's still a car. It's not a roller coaster. Universal, like as much as people want to say, Oh, they're catching up. 
they will never catch up. Right? I would say that they, if I didn't go to Universal and see all the failings of a, a number of things that happen at Universal, I, yeah. I still like that Universal exists. I love yeah. to go there every now and then, but their their customer service is not better. No, right? What they do better is their perception that they care about you as an annual pass holder. Yeah, that they want to do you a solid and have a little lounge. For I understand you wanting. I understand why people feel good that they're valued, but like building a Fast and Furious ro- like they are ordering a roller coaster from a independent contractor that's mm-hmm. not them making it they're ordering that from an independent contractor they have done none of the real des- R&D or design of that ride system themselves that's not their that's what creation. they did for uh, for Velocicoaster too yeah right? it's not theirs yeah no they did the story side um for sure but they didn't design the ride like a roller coaster manufacturer um, designed and built the ride and look Disney orders roller coasters from a manufacturer but WDI created the ride system. Like, yeah, they ordered the track and the vehicle stuff from them, but it's still WDI created. Yeah. Yeah, as opposed to Universal, where it's like, we we you know, we worked with the roller coaster. Hagrid's is a little different. Hagrid's they they did a little more creatively. Hagrid's but, is awesome. It's but Velocicoaster ride. and this upcoming Fast and Furious thing are really, you know. It, it's we ordered something cool from a third party from a couple of third party manufacturers. So the Universal's got to get off the bus with the screen, the Kong, no. the, uh, the Skull Island or whatever, yeah. and uh, Fast Kart and Furious. Is, I know people Mario like Kart Mario is, Kart. I just I've always been disappointed by it. I just think it's super disappointing. And the Yoshi ride, they did get away from screens and then built one of the shortest, lamest dark rides ever built with Yoshi, and it's so disappointing. It so happens. disappointing. It happens. Um, but a lot of people love Mario Kart. I think Mario Kart will work out because um, I, I might be in the minority who just doesn't think that augmented reality is cool, but I just thought it takes away from it. But maybe it's just me. I think that's one that's not going to age well, right? No, it's not. They're going to have to probably, you were talking like 10 years tops before you have to do something with it, I assume. But we'll, we'll see what happens. Let's go around the other side. Imagine Imagination is what it is, right? It's... A third iteration, a third iteration. I'm just saying we're we're it's doing keeping score where we're at. Um, it is what it is. It's not popular. Uh, it's not great. It's not as t- terrible as it used to be. It's not as great as it used to be. Um, More people are going to the meet and greet behind the ride than mm-hmm. on the ride, probably at this point. That's definitely true. It might actually the ride might be getting a resurgence, right? Just I think it's plastic. It's fine. So it's is most of the table. park at this point. <laughs> I'm looking for something wooden to knock on. And the rock. Oh, this is wood. The oh, yeah, Tomorrowland sign. Tomorrow sign. Not knock the rocket that. rod sign. Anyway. Knock on that. Uh, so, you know, I don't think there's a whole lot to say about what's going on at the land or the seas no, in terms of the happened. reimagining yeah. of Epcot. We talked about Austin awesome um, Planner already. And, and uh, the front of the park, I... The one good thing. Yeah. Um, the points of light. That's great. Is amazing. Happy accident, right? Did, did I ever tell you that story? Well, I have heard that it was supposed to be projections on yeah. there, and they didn't have any buildings to put projectors in because they knocked them down. Yeah, they realized after they knocked down the buildings, there wasn't a good mount point for projectors. So um, instead, uh, someone at WDI was like, what about these? And then so Disney Live Entertainment apparently did not, when they showed them the lights, was like, this is not what we asked for. This is not what we asked for. And then they moved forward with it, and they turned the thing on, and they were like, oh, well, that that works. Oh, we made fun of it, right? We're the, hey, the tap light. They're putting in more tap lights. It did seem lights. comical, but then once you saw it turn and on, you're like, you're like, oh, okay. Wow, this it doesn't cool. even look real. Some some of the color yeah. schemes, it looks like yeah. it looks like concept art. It's amazing. Yeah. It's neat. Now they could probably stand to scrub the top of Spaceship Earth. It's looking pretty grimy yeah. right now, but at nighttime, that is a stunner. It's and you cool. drive by at night, yeah. you're not even in the park, and it's amazing. It's very cool. Um, and the you know the they put the pylons in. They look great. Gives me good vibes. I don't yeah, know. The, the entrance is way better. I mean, the, the '90s, the 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 Millennium entrance was not good, yeah. and they did a they did a nice job. I like the entrance now. I think I, I could. I'm not huge. I would fan like of the some music different loop. music. Yeah. I was just gonna say I could use a, a music loop that someone in the music department at WDI actually made, um, maybe with you know Epcot music in it. But otherwise, like I mean, it's great to see the fountain back. That's wonderful. Um, yeah. I love the Spaceship Earth sewer covers. I mean, yeah. Ah, uh, the sewer co- themed sewer covers, except when they had yeah. a Galaxy's Edge one. Yeah, remember that? They're like, uh, we we broke a s- 
a manhole cover? At least cover someone was like, hey, we can't put the regular ones there. They're like, I guess we'll yeah. put one of these for now. The manhole covers. Yeah. Um, it's worth pointing out that um, Spaceship Earth was scheduled to be closed on May 26th of 2020. Yeah. For what we assume was a pretty large and extensive They said it was. Spaceship Earth, our shared story. It was a yeah. complete reimagining of the ride where the story was, it was now um, the history of storytelling instead of communication. It is, Spaceship Earth is rough right now. Yeah, it's not doing well. I, I don't dislike the ride. It's rough. Some of the, several it's my of the screen, least favorite version. I don't really like the screen portion of the Descent anyway. No one does. Um, but several of the screens no longer work or yeah. work sporadically yeah. or don't recognize the your ride touch properly. The ride time. system is very clunky and yeah. herky-jerky and there's a lot of stops yeah. and fits and starts and all that kind of stuff. Spaceship Earth could use some TLC. I, I'm yeah. sad that all, out of all of these things they're mentioning, redoing... Um, Obviously, test track, and yeah. they built a whole new roller coaster, and all this other stuff. And that apparently, Spaceship Earth has just fallen by the wayside. Yeah, what was really cool, I thought was really neat, was they were going to move the entrance and exit. So both the entrance and the exit were going to be behind Spaceship Earth now, which huh. I thought was great. Like, think about not having that queue uh, yeah. down under there. Like, obviously, that mural needs to stay until the end of time. But yeah. Um, like, I thought that was a super cool idea where it's like, oh, that, that would help out a lot. That'd be great. I think the the wonder of that as a child coming into this park, and you see this huge round thing. Yeah. And you're like, oh, wait. I can not only go inside there, but I can go a to ride. the top of it. And that's I still a think ride? that is one of the greatest that's... engineering feats in the history of mankind. Like, not even just theme park. Like putting people in real spaceships. Mankind. Been, we put people in real spaceships. And but it's the first, like, they, they achieved something. It was, it was yeah. not only what, like, take away the ride. It's the first freestanding geodesic sphere in the world that had never been done. Not only had that never been done, then they were like, we're going to put a ride in it and animatronics. And at the top, you look like you're in space. I'm thinking of the polio vaccine flight. I said architecture. No, architecture. You didn't. What did I did say? I, didn't say? I said engineering. Just, you said technological. I said engineering. Oh, did you? Yeah. yeah. I got bad Maybe I didn't. But engineering is it not one of the greatest engineering or architectural feats in the history of mankind? I, I, I mean, there are pyramids in Egypt. They still don't know how they were built. I'm not They're, saying it's greater than the pyramid. I'm saying, is it not in the conversation for the top 10 or 20? It's pretty cool. I don't know. I don't know. I, I assume there are some things that have had a much larger impact on humankind that you can talk about. I, I get it. In, th in terms of th the context of theme parks or amusement, it's right up there, right? It's got to be one of the coolest things anyone's ever done. But as a kid going, oh, I can go in this thing? Like... This is a signature. This should be a signature attraction. Are you going to tell me the contemporary is not one of the greatest architectural feats in the history of mankind? That had never been done before. Okay. Every time someone builds a roller coaster, they point out the things that it does that no other roller coaster has ever. This is the first coaster ever to have a 4G negative dive. When you do that. Yeah, I, I get it, right? That's These not... are the. the Build architecture is full of things that have never been done before. No, but like you're inventing whole new shapes and processes, right? Roller coasters like the process ours is ten are, feet yeah. taller, so it goes faster and it does right. Like that's a lot of it. But in the case of like the contemporary and spaceship Earth, it's all right. We built the first all steel A frame structure with modular rooms that can be slid in and out, and a monorail runs through the middle of it, a space age transportation technology, at least as far as we're concerned, as humans right now. I think it's amazing, but if you look in a context of the greater world around us and you talk to all the top architects, I don't know that they would agree that that's one of the most groundbreaking buildings of all time. I think it's fantastic. It's spectacular. Okay. But I don't agree. I, I think that's a bit hyperbolic, perhaps. I don't think so. All right. Write it on the wall. Hang a banner. We're in the studio. It's the greatest architectural achievement of all time. I didn't say the greatest. I said one of. Okay. I'm talking talking top 20-ish of all time in all of mankind. The process is the interesting part, right? Because everybody yeah. builds stuff prefab. Off Spaceship now. Earth is more, I think, way more amazing than the contemporary. I, I mm. Let me say that I think they're two very different things. But the construction process of the contemporary has probably revolutionized building construction yeah. more than sure. than building a geodesic dome, yeah. right, or sphere. Um, 
you know, every ship that's built now uses those processes. Every, yeah. you know, what? I'm sorry, we're getting way off track because we've got to get, uh, eventually now, we arrive at Journey of Water inspired by Moana. So I'm not going to say. The newest attraction. So people on, on, on our YouTube channel can go watch my honest review. So I've talked about this for 30 minutes. I want to hear, now that you we took you to a preview, I want to hear what you think of it. Story time. Uh, Tom and I were invited to a cast member preview of Journey of Water, inspired by Moana, um, brought to you by Nestle Water. I don't, whatever it's going to be. Oh um, and I was very excited to go. It was pouring rain yesterday. Yeah. Bad, like, I texted Tom. I was like, are we doing this? Because it's not just, like, Florida rain, right? It's, like, extremely heavy rain. And thunder Can't see my car from there, the front yeah. door type of rain. And I said, yeah. So I go. I uh, get in a car, I get there, and the rain had lightened up quite a bit, actually. Yeah. And uh, we met our friends, and we proceeded to the attraction. Yeah. It is raining. I have an umbrella. We are inside 30 seconds. We barely entered. And the speakers come up, you know, attention, guests, Journey of Water, inspired by Moana, is now closed due to approaching inclement weather. I think it specifically Please. said lightning in the area. No, they said approaching inclement weather. Oh, okay. Right, something like that. Anyway, um, please proceed to the exit. Yeah. And then they turned off all the features, and we're like, well, we're in. We can't go back through the it entrance. Said, we proceed just walked to the through, exit. go to the exit. Yeah. So we at least walked through it. Yeah. Uh, and thankfully, after uh, we went uh, and did other stuff for a few minutes, I guess. Rose and Rose Crown? Just tell people go to Rose where we went. The most revolutionary bar of maybe Shut in up. history. Shut um, <laughs> Shut up. I didn't say so, the most revolutionary structure. I said one of the greatest engineering feats in the history of mankind. One of. That okay. could be top 20-ish. Okay. Um, it's so no the wall or whatever that thing is you showed me. Saudi, the line Saudi Arabia. In Saudi the Arabia. Line. Yeah, that's quite an interesting yeah. uh, story. Look it up, them. kids. Um, which would be great. Perfect for a Skyliner or a monorail. Yeah. You open it, right? They do have a train that runs yeah. straight up and down. Yeah. Underneath, I think. Yeah. Um, anyway, so we went, had a drink. And then we were able to go back uh, shortly before the park closed. It was nighttime, and uh, which I think, based on YouTube videos I've so seen, beautiful. looks like looks like the best time to yeah. go to this. It's really pretty yeah. at night. Uh, the lighting is really well done. It's playing uh, Moana music softly wherever you go, and it, the music seems to be sort of in sync with the experience. I think they did a good job of scoring that where you kind of feel like this is exactly the right vibe for this yeah, experience. Yeah, it's upbeat of, and fun, but not distracting, yeah. Um, I think uh, children will love it. Kids, I mean, kids were already wet, right, because yeah. it was pouring rain. So many kids were in the, like, splash area yeah. where they, where there's there's an area where there's just little guy little geysers coming up out just of the Just like ground. an actual splash pit. Right, yeah. and they're just sitting, mean, kids were having a blast yeah. in there. I, I think it's going to be very popular. I mean, it's a walkthrough, right? There's not a lot of commitment there. Yeah. Walk through it. Um, now, the time it took to build this uh, is not commensurate with the quality of and scope of the attraction, right? I don't it's, think we should bring that into the conversation. I don't think it's necessary. Um, okay. Because, You're like, fine. that was a that was a corporate decision, right? That Does that affect the fun, the enjoyment, or the quality of the project? I don't think it does. Um, so it's a weird point to make when, you know. I think it's important. It that, that we've, we've given up a lot as park guests of, we've given up a lot of this park for several years now, not been able to use it because this no is taking up a lot of space. No public's going to care how long it took to build it. They're just going to go and it's going to be open and they're going to go in it. The sacrifice that we make as park guests is important to the context of whether or not this Ride I notice everyone likes Tron, working. and now no one no one even bothers to talk about the time it took to build Tron. And uh, I think that's know. important to the context of that ride, but that's just me. It was held. I mean, they they held it for a while. They, mm -hmm. It's like a movie, right? My enjoyment of a movie is not affected by the moving up or the moving back of a release date. It doesn't affect my enjoyment of the film. It, it shouldn't affect the, the attraction, right? Test Track was delayed... How many times? Test track opening spring 97, opening summer 97, opening fall 97, opening 98, opening soon. And then finally, you know, uh, almost two years later than it was supposed to open, the thing finally opened. Didn't affect my enjoyment of it. I still thought it was great. All right. Well, moving on. Um, 
aside from the time it took to build, there are a couple things about it that I think are are fantastic. There are a couple things about it that I think are are kind of head scratchers. Right. And uh, number one, the the feel I feel, and the, this could be a good thing or a bad thing. It feels like the queue to a Moana ride that yeah. doesn't exist. So I felt like I was queued up for some kind of Moana ride at the end that yeah. we would go to. It's a, it would be a very well-themed queue. And it's reminiscent to me of the queue to uh, Flight of Passage, Avatar Flight of Passage, right? It's the got that kind of feel, the around. blue lighting, the, yeah. you know, it just has a kind of, now there are more, inter, there are interactive features along there where you yeah. put your hand into water several times yeah. and do all these things. But in general, it feels like a queue. I don't think I don't know if that's a good thing or a yeah. bad thing, um, but maybe because it reminded me of Flight of Passage, it also made me think, man, this would have fit better in Animal Kingdom. I know that's going to be a common yeah, criticism. Yeah, I know fair. that you might um, rebut that criticism because I know that you're a big fan of this attraction. Um, Just because I'm a fan of it doesn't mean I think it went in the right place. Yeah. That was the the only two criticism I uh, criticisms I had was number one, it does feel like it probably didn't go there. I mean, I think it it works as an Epcot attraction. It does for, first and foremost teach about the water cycle. The water cycle is the main aspect. Then Moana is the secondary thing that, that works for me. But at the same time, like it does feel like it should be an animal kingdom. And the other thing is it not being open access, like it having a queue and a flow through. Yeah. I'm not wild about it. I think it should have been more of a series of pathways that you could cut through if you wanted to. Right. My, when I first heard descriptions, I thought it was going to be kind of a, a, a path through It was supposed to be. When it was and originally, now it kind of starts where it ends. When it was envisioned as just Journey of Water before it had Moana connected to it, that's what it was for many years, and then it morphed into what it is now. I think to make it an Ep- more of an Epcot feel would be this is the, this is the cycle of water, yeah. But here's what scientists are doing to, you know what I mean, to to make this better in the future. Yeah, but or at least here's it's the... Yeah, like the land, right? Here are yeah. clever farming techniques that people are using that are more yeah. efficient. Things like that. I can well, understand that. some of that's that. in the seas, right? So the right. thing the seas doesn't talk about is the water cycle, right? Right. And so the, the thing that this at least does, it talks about how conservation of water begins at home, right? And there's a lot yeah, of that. Take shorter there. showers. Yeah. Turn off the faucet when you brush your teeth. All these... All these yeah. Fine ideas. Um, I feel like they are more in line with Animal Kingdom's sort of mission and style. Yeah. Um, that doesn't mean that this shouldn't exist. Yeah. If my choices are not have this at all or just have it Epcot, I would rather have it at Epcot. I do like it. I but think it could it, replace the Boneyard. That'd be great. <laughs> that's a fantastic idea. Put yeah. it put it in a Boneyard. Or, but now instead we're going to get Encanto and, and Indiana Jones. Oh, really? Some of those Tree of Life trails? They go on forever. There's, there's space oh, I like that the, the animals are there. Like Especially the if I could look in it and see the otters and like, oh, mm. and the water also creates places for otters to live. That would be oh. fantastic. Uh, in general, though, I feel like they've established now, they've made it clear what the new Epcot is going to be. And it's kind of a mishmash of things. It's not anything. It's yeah, kind it's of a, just a hodgepodge of things with a little bit added here to make it seem like you could make a case for it being an Epcot, yeah. but I don't feel like any of that stuff in, you know, any of the new stuff in Future World feels like Epcot. I don't feel yeah. like it belongs in Epcot. No, at the Epcot we knew as kids is, is long gone and dead and buried. And, um, the That's grave, part of life, though. And this... the grave has been defiled several times, but... Uh... <laughs> this is This is... Everybody that's grown up has dealt with this, right? Yeah. Something they loved or something they had fond memories of either went away. Uh, you know, as someone who grew up in the '80s, the shopping mall, right? Those are going mm-hmm. away. That was that was the thing. Everyone went to the mall. Yeah. Those are being uh, demolished, right? All these life changes. They paved paradise and put up a parking lot. You know, all that kind of stuff. And now they're taking Epcot and they're making it um, better uh, in their minds for. Whatever this next generation is. I just feel like other Disney parks are allowed to evolve and they keep, like they hold on to the things that are most valuable and the things that change are kind of the the you know peripherals, right? Think about Disneyland. Yeah, not the connective um, tissue, right? Yeah, it's, we think about like Disney Sea over the 20-something years that's existed, even Disneyland Paris. Um, you know, the all the core stuff is still there. Um, I mean, most of those are castle parks, but... Um, yeah, I just think it's it's weird. I just think it's weird that like Epcot and Hollywood Studios in particular have very little of their original identity. I mean, Hollywood Studios has none of its original identity. Every the only Disney park in the world that doesn't have an opening day attraction. 
Yep. Yeah. So. And um, and frankly, I feel like some of the opening day attractions are were worthy of sticking around. Yeah. This isn't like this isn't like DCA where the park didn't connect with anyone. And no one updated. liked it, and you have to just overhaul yeah. it, right? This is you can update things. Yeah. We update Pirates and Mansion, right? The Great Movie Ride certainly could have been updated. Um, and in the case of Epcot, like. Would a modern version of Horizons have worked? Yeah, I think it would. I think Figment didn't need to be closed. It needed to be updated, right? These these were these were huge mistakes that dictated the rest of Epcot's existence. That has been a it's been a it's been a disaster for twenty something years now, and now we have to live with this version. I know. Look, there are people that claim to love this version. I don't know if that's authentic or not. Uh, there's some people that just like to say they love everything. Um, maybe they do. Maybe the Epcot means something to somebody else, I think. But mm -hmm. if you have any recollection of what was one of the most interesting and probably, possibly the best Disney park in the world at one point, uh, I think the Disney Sea of its generation was Epcot Center. Um, you know, you, you know what you're missing. And there's a lot of stuff at Epcot that does not reach the grandeur, the inspirational notes, um, any of the, the quality of a lot of that stuff that was done in the 80s. The artistry is is very much lost in a lot of this park. Um, yeah. And and I think it's it's just worth, you know, reiterating that one issue that I see at Disney World more than anywhere else anyway is this sort of interruption of the story, this lack of continuity and lack of awareness of context of where you are. Yeah. So uh, this even goes to, you know, into Hollywood, Hollywood Studios in several places. Um, obviously... The, we would probably have been much less critical of Mickey and Minnie's Runaway Railway if it had been an animation area of I the park. I still don't think it's great. I mean, I no, like but it better I, in I think it's better at Disneyland. But I still don't think it's a great ride. Well, But, but it's much better at Disneyland. You you walk through um, the other side of Hollywood Studios and, oh, I'm in Star Wars. And then, wait, yeah. then I'm not. And then, oh, I'm in Star Wars again. Like, yeah. the, the, the storytelling is, there's an opportunity yeah. for storytelling that it is interrupted. Yeah. Right? And I... Some of that's just the, I mean, all of this is due to limitation, right? They come up with an idea to do something and they go, yeah. where do we put it? And then they go, okay, we put it there. Great. And then they go, oh, crap. How do we explain this? And I go, we don't. Don't worry about yeah. it. Just people come and pay money to ride the new thing. Yeah. That's the same thing here. I think we have attractions that um, are are good attractions that might belong somewhere else. And yeah. nothing you could do about it, right? It's... It's the reality. They made of the business. decisions, and it happened, and it, it is what it is. I would rather have this than have web slingers, which yeah, that's fair. Is works in the context yeah. of where it is in the park, but isn't a good attraction. No, it certainly could have been worse. I mean, at least Guardians is good, and at least Moana turned out really nice, and uh, at least Harmonious didn't stay. Um, <laughs> there we go. Win, win, win. Yeah, and Remy's added capacity. You know, it's another thing to do, whether I love it or not. It's something else to do. Well, I still lament the fact that that you know. Um, the the uh, Bucos people did not let them build the Remy restaurant, but I thought about that too. It. That's Soon. sad. Bistro Chez Remy is probably the highlight of Walt Disney Studios Paris. Not that there's a lot to highlight in that park, but I mean, it's a really cool restaurant. Like that would be forget about be our guest. Forget about a lot of those other restaurants. If you told people they could eat like. You know, like, and look at Roundup Rodeo does does a really poor job of what Bistro Chez Remy does, which is shrinking you down to that size. Like that would forget it. If 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 would if Roundup Rodeo is hard to book, Bistro Chez Remy at Disney World would be the most impossible table to get. I want to sit on a wine cork. Oh, it's it's amazing. Yeah, the wine wine cork stools and the the tables. It's like the top of a sardine can is the table, and then you look underneath, and the base is a bottle cap. So it's a it's a bottle cap and a stick and a sardine can top, and it's fantastic. Do we have a video of that here on our? I camp? have a walkthrough tour. Yeah, it's on the. I've, channel. I've yeah. heard about it. it looks, I've seen pictures. I love it. Amazing. I'm so excited. We're recording this before I leave for Paris, but I'll be honest with you. One of the things I'm looking forward to most with my parents is taking them to Bistro Chez Remy, just because I think. They'll just be so enamored with the big Christmas lights and the giant, and you sit in a booth that's just two giant plates on a rack, and it's wow. it's so cute. And there's tables with umbrellas, and they're they're big drink umbrellas. It's it's that's fun. It's Disney storytelling at its best. You were in the movie. There are no concessions made. There is no thematic break. It is you're in you're in you're fully in the place you saw in the movie. You can say that for Roundup Rodeo Barbecue. I mean. 
Yeah, but it's, it's a cool interior. Yeah, it's but it's like fun. just boxes. But They're it's like, more it's plain to boxes. kids. Boxes. Right? Yeah, it's like it's everything's blocks. a box though, because we spent money on five props, and the rest is going to be boxes. Because boxes mm. are easy. Yeah, I get it. And from what I saw of Shea Remy, by the way, it's like the tables are all different. Yeah. And Roundup Rodeo it's is kind of like there's a long row of these by the bo They're box unthemed. with a ruler as the. Yeah, yeah and the tables aren't themed. Yeah. At Bisher Shiremi, it looks like a bunch of rats stole stuff from a restaurant and threw their own restaurant together, and it exists within the vents of the building of the restaurant, yeah. and that's amazing. Yeah, that's amazing. I that, that at Epcot would have been tremendous. It would have given the ride more of a reason to exist, except for with the, now we got the stupid crepery, which has the ugliest interior I've ever seen. It's gray. It's purely gray. And also, the crepes oh, they serve outside are better than the crepes. The outside they serve ones are inside. better than inside. Mm -hmm. I agree, totally agree. But they they're worth getting outside. They're delicious. I love them. I suppose we yeah. It's good that we came around to that because I didn't think of that as uh, part of the reimagination yeah. of Epcot. Yeah. It absolutely is, and you can in include the Skyliner too because it totally transformed yeah. International Gateway. Yeah. Um, you know, there's there's a lot going on at Epcot, and yet it feels yeah. like we haven't gotten anywhere. It's weird, right? Yeah, like. You know, at this point, the festivals are the lifeblood of the park. It's nice that there's now ride. Like, Guardians is weird because I remember the last time people went to festivals then also said they had to ride something because I think for a long time that wasn't a conversation people had. Um, you know, because Soren kind of came about before the festivals really hit peak popularity. Um, but now something has opened in the festival era where people are like, oh, my God, I got to – we got to go on Guardians. We got to get a boarding group. Yeah. Soren had um, a good decade there, though, where it was like yeah. the – the e-ticket, right? People it was, still love it. It right? was the 90 to 120 minute wait for and now Soren. Good and... Soren is back. Oh yeah, good Soren. See, that's an improvement for me. Like, there's there's a couple things that have just happened. Like Moana turned out good, and Soren's coming back, and we're getting a test track fix. Yeah. Like I'm I'm kind of optimistic that that the rest maybe could be fixed, and if we get a new Figment ride, then I you know in five years I could sit here and be like, I kind of like Epcot again. <laughs> I like. Good Soren's there, and Test Track has scenes now. But good Soren's only temporary. And the nighttime show's good, and then Figment has a ride again that's good. Could you imagine? I rode Good Soren a few months ago because they yeah. do it at DCA when they uh, Jason and, and I were hand there you oranges. for the first day of their food and wine festival. Yeah, and they handed us cuties on the way out. Well, thank you for the cuties. It's very thoughtful. Yeah, and uh, yeah, remind I've. It proved that they have a love and understanding for why people like that yeah. ride, the things that resonate with them. That you know, yeah. the oranges are the th are the thing everyone remembers from that ride, yeah. right? You're someone is if you're trying to describe to your grandmother what Soren is like, you're like, well, you're flying over this thing, but then when you fly over the orange grove, it smells like oranges. But that's yeah. that's something that existed at Epcot before. Of course, it did. But the Soren yeah. and Horizons. And Horizons. I'll course. never forget the first time we wrote, because I had never been the to same, DCA. They use the same bucket of stuff. Yeah, I'd never yeah. been to DCA. So 2005, we go for the opening of Soren, and my cousin and I are on the ride, and we go through the, and you smell the oranges, and we both looked at, you just looked at each other and go, oh my God, Horizons. Yeah. <laughs> like, that was the first thought we had. Like, that stuck with people so much that it's like, oh my God, the orange smell is bad. The burning of Rome smell, the orange, orange smell. smell. Yeah. Now we have the the pine needles, basically, I think, smell when yeah. you, from Soren. Um, elephant. <laughs> Never mind. Elephant dust. Yeah. <laughs> Pocket sand. Pocket they do, yeah, the, <laughs> the, the dank smell of a dark cave on um, Flight of Passage. Oh my God. They've perfected it. It's great. So what do you think, like, so that's where I want to end, I think, is just saying, like, between the Test Track news and Soren and now the Figment meet and greet coming back and, and maybe, you know, knock on wood, this nighttime show turns out well despite uh, Panar Toprak, you know, botching the score. Um, allegedly. Allegedly? I mean, no, not allegedly. Sources working on the show, multiple, said it, so not allegedly. Um, but anyway, I don't care. Uh Look forward to an angry email again from her people. Um, I I think that I'm somewhat optimistic of what the next phase will be. We, we survived the Chapek era, and uh, maybe things can be better now. Yeah, I think it's on the road to recovery, right? That's yeah. the best you could say about it is we may not agree with the direction they went, but you're yeah. it's but it's still it's still on its way to being something that has more stuff to do besides yeah. just go to festivals, which I think, look, I like a festival as much as the next guy, but... 
I'm also looking forward to being able to walk straight through the middle of the park. Yeah. That'd be a big thing, right? I'm tired of walking around the park to get anywhere. I'm going to walk down the middle. I agree. So we're mere months away from that. Yeah. Allegedly. Possibly. Depending on Punar Toprak's score. <laughs> the opinions expressed by Tom Corliss on this program do not necessarily reflect those. They are, the yeah, they are opinions, and you can't sue people for opinions. So, anyway. Well, another episode in the books then, Tom. Yeah. I, I uh, would be remiss if I didn't ask who sponsors this show. Carousel of Products at carouselproducts.com. That's where I got this fantastic WDWNT logo button down and also the shirt underneath, which is sold out that I can't promote. Um, but we have lots of good stuff, and there's currently an autumn sale going on uh, where some merchandise is 50 to 75% off. So go to carouselproducts.com. Shop today. A great way to support the show. That and the other great way to support the show. The WDWNT Interglobe Society. Yes, the wigs. Uh, you can become a Wigs member for as little as $2 a month. You get early access to events. You get discounts on show, shows and events. Early access to this and, podcast, uh, and of probably. Course, we're working on Yeah, that. access yeah. to our Discord community where people in there fight or plan or scheme <laughs> or whatever they do on Discord. They have a good time. Because I'm not there watching very often. But, yeah, the Wigs, you can go to patreon.com slash WWNT or WWNT.com slash Patreon. Either way. And you can join, like I said, for as little as 2 bucks a month. Yeah. You could be... You, you could be one of us. Isn't that great? Be a wig. Be a wig. Anyway, that's it for this episode. Please, if you have uh, questions for us, you can email the show at podcast at www.nt.com. And we'll, we might get the email even. I don't know. I'll talk to Jason and see how that works. And <laughs> Technology is difficult for us. We only run a website and a YouTube channel yeah. and all kinds of technological oh, stuff. Boy. One of the greatest achievements in the history of technology. You're the worst. So thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time on the WW News Today podcast. WW News Today podcast. Do you know the name of the company you work for? WW. It's WDW. It just doesn't flow the tongue. All right. We'll see you next time. See you real soon. Bye.